Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Thanks to my sponsor this week, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. You have a show. I, I think I should first of all say so everything band I feel like is for me at least one of the one of the premier like music education podcasts. It's one of the ones oh, I appreciate that. that. Yeah, the most regularly. And I appreciate that um you know, your commitment to it and the consistency of it and also like just, you know, how um rich and diverse the guests are, but also how there's always I mean, I feel like it's one of those things where there's always something that I can get out of it listening to an episode. Um, yeah, there are very few duds. I, I'm, I'm proud of that. I mean, I won't say who or what, but there are a couple where it's like, well, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't put those in my top 10, but for the most part, I think the quality is pretty high. I wish that my audio quality, especially in the beginning was as high, but you know, I think I've got ironed most of that out now. Well, and for you and for me, and this is why you made me think of, of your show is, is like, I, I do think there is, um, for, I think anyone doing it on the side, like, because I also teach lots of, like, my main side thing is, like, I teach a lot of private studio. You know, I have a, private sure. studio, a lot of private lessons. And, um, you know, I think for anyone who's, like, doing, working as a busy practicing music educator, like, having a podcast is, like, a really, it's just a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. So, you know, understandable. Uh, <laughs> but also, like, awesome that it's, that it has been, uh, so consistent. And I feel like for me, the, there's like a point of diminishing return where at least now I'm telling myself like this, there's so many, um, like there's like a certain degree of audio quality that's like I'm proud of, but then there's a certain part of me also that's like, Hey, I have like this great recording of this great conversation. I need to like follow the rule of just chip it and yeah, yeah, yeah. put it out there. Um, and so with that, you know, I feel like since, especially since we've been back in person over the past school year, like I've been cutting some corners with, you know, some editing things and like, you know, one or two close friends will like write to me and be like, Hey, at like one minute and 43 seconds. this," <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, yeah. that's me. That's me. But anyway, the, so the tool I'm using is called Descript and I don't know how to, it's the kind of thing where it's like, I, I don't know how to function any other way without it. it. It basically takes the audio and then it analyzes it and like transcribes it as a script. So you edit the, the audio, like uh-huh. the word document. Uh huh. And that it's, it's like built on web technology. So it's like, it's in the same way that like using a Google doc is not as smooth and fluent as like using Microsoft word. It's got like some clunkiness to it, but it, I, at this point now it's like, if I know it's like, okay, I want to edit a spot. I remember the the guest said this word, like the ability to, the ability to just search mm-hmm. a script and like go to that spot is, you know, and then kind of like clip and, and drag and edit things that way has been is pretty useful. And I think they, I had, I didn't, they don't advertise it, but they do have an educator discount for like, I think it's maybe five bucks a month, which I'm now on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, 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 I don't want to like, I know Soundtrap does that because I actually, um, did a little research project where I took the answer to one of my final questions and analyzed all of the guests to come up. It's the question about what are the problems facing band. And so I, actually Soundtrap has tra- a transcription tool. So I transcribed all of them on Soundtrap, and then I was able to search for that particular question and then just trim it using that tool. So I kind of know a little bit about what it is. How many of your episodes did you have Soundtrap analyzed? That sounds like a lot. Well, I I basically picked, I don't know, what did I take, 30 or 35 of the most downloaded? Um, You know, it's all arbitrary. I mean, I could have taken them completely randomly, Mm -hmm. but I figured, you know, 35 of the most downloaded seemed as arbitrary as any other selection method, you know? Sure. I I guess, I guess if we were talking about, you know, academic rigor, I would have probably have done something, you know, double random kind of stuff, you know, from the research methods kind of stuff. But I wasn't that interested in doing that. Yeah. I mean, that certainly makes sense. So yeah, actually, let me ask you this. One of the reasons I thought, one of the things I thought would be fun to do since you're here is like you, I mean, you're, I'm always hearing your voice, in the spot in the position because one of the things about your show is your show is like really i would consider it to be like pretty interview focused like you're you know you have like you're you're trying to like you know get Mm -hmm. perspective always of your guest at least from the majority of that listen right you know i mean you but you on the receiving end like some of the best educators i know are the observers you know the people who sort of like Mm -hmm. Just try to gain as many perspectives as they can. They 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 mm-hmm. still even in their later teaching years observe other teachers teach and try to try sure. you know, new ideas. You've been on the receiving end of all of this great wisdom. I know. 
are there any standout things you've learned? And maybe I'll frame this like a little bit more specifically. Like I know that there's some things that I've believed and done as a teacher for the whole decade or more that I've been teaching that haven't really changed. But there's also been like some big, pretty big moments of, pers- you know, perspective or like practice shift and like how I've like I'd say like the pandemic. We can get into this later if you want. But like I'd say like the past yeah. couple of years has been one sh- really major shift. Like I've really transformed the way I'm doing things in the band room. Um, over the past few years, like, would you say that there's any standout tidbits of wisdom that have shaped you <laughs> since doing the show? Well, it's funny because after about a hundred episodes, I actually presented on this very topic in New York for the New York state school music educators conference. And it was, I only had like 85 or a hundred episodes or something like that. So here I'm talking about all these things I've learned. And then I did it again at Midwest after like 175 <laughs> and you know, it's, it's, it was easier when there were fewer episodes to say what I've learned. But I think the biggest thing is it's about me and learning about myself because I've heard all these amazing educators. And so there are trends that develop, right? We, you know, the one thing that really, and this is why I did that little research project is the one thing that really comes across to me is most people who are involved in music education feel like, um, connecting with the kids and, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't even, I can't believe I'm forgetting this word, you know, where we connect with society, where it's, it's, uh, it's everything's in context, you know, making sure that what we do is uh, relevant. <laughs> I don't know how, how I couldn't remember that word. <laughs> okay. Relevant wins round one against me, but <laughs> you know, the relevance of what we do is I think one thing that's, you know, one of the themes that's emerged over all the episodes, but I don't think it's about like things I've learned about tricks and tips in the classroom. There are a couple that are standouts, of course, that I can look back on, but it's really about what it's done for me as a person. Because when I first started this, I was a college professor. I was teaching music theory five days a week, um, grading theory papers all the time. I was writing some band music, but I, you know, I had an itch to get back into to the band world. I had an itch to get back into the community where I started my teaching career And, um, you know, the podcast dragged me back into the, you know, teaching, I teach fourth through eighth grade now, and I'm happier than I've ever been as a teacher. Now I have some other unfulfilled career (laughs) aspirations that that, you know, I had, there's a trade off for all of these things, right? So it hasn't been a perfect ride, but it's, it's more than anything. The podcast has focused me to do what I'm really the best at. And that's really teaching kids and teaching band music. My, my best success was my first high school teaching job without a question. And I, I was on a, I was on a great path in my current job until the pandemic torpedoed that, but <laughs> we begin yeah. anew. Um, I don't, and I don't, I don't say that to kind of be arrogant, but it's, that's not what it's about. I'm, I, I'm very humble, I think as a person, but I, I think I do a good job building bands basically. And I don't think I was doing a good job. I was a good theory teacher, I think, or a decent theory teacher. They didn't hate me. Um, but you know, it's, it's when you're teaching intervals and then you're teaching part writing and then you're teaching, you know, chromatic medians, there's not a lot of joy in that classroom. Kids don't go out saying this was the best day ever, right. like a sixth grader does, you know? And, um, after 16 years of theory teaching, it was soul crushing and the podcast really made me realize what I was missing. And I, so I, there's no one lesson. It's really about me. And, um, I know that maybe, I don't know, maybe that's not what you're looking for, but it truly, it's profound for me as my own career. Yeah. Yeah. There is a connection that you can't, and it's like you, it's funny you're, you're, you're saying that it's about like your decision came from within yourself, but it's funny you, the way you phrase it only because I think like it, it does come down to like who you are, but also like for me as a teacher, I'm feeling like my, uh, inserting myself, like my ego or my personality into my band room actually has so much less. To, I thought it had so much to do with how I develop a connection and it does. It has a lot to do, but it actually like yeah. today in class, we had a, an eighth grade trumpet player who like arranged. I don't know if you've ever played the video game Overcooked for. Oh yeah. 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 Really fun multiplayer, mm-hmm. you know, yep. cute, cute, uh, game. He like arranged it, all the themes in it into a medley for <laughs> band and, and mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I, he sent me the Muse score file and I was like, okay, cool. And then, but like, he actually like really like, you know, considered the, the ranges of the instruments. Like I could tell that he like lo- had mm-hmm. gone and looked at some scores of some like of the music, you know, that we were working mm-hmm. on in class and like made sure the ranges were good and we played it. And, um, 
And and the and I didn't realize that my students could like sight read in the key of G and con- like concert G and concert C major. They did it. They, you know, they hung on and it was done. And everyone just like starts cheering and clapping for him. And I'm like, I just decided to do his thing today. Like I didn't had yeah. nothing to do with like how I feel or who I am. But all of a sudden, like all of them left with this energy of like, yeah, or one of our peers like did this thing, and it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, it's not it's not really about me. And I think uh, you know we talk about these lessons and, and a lot of it has really focused me on a lot of the things I knew going into teaching in the first place, but they get lost in the minutia of being a band director. Right. You know, I just had a really funny moment in the last episode I released where, you know, the teachers, you know, we talked about how being a band director is so many other things than making music. And so you'd better love music because you don't get to do a whole lot of it at the end of the day. And you know, it's, um, you know, it's sort of reinforcing those reasons why I wanted to be a band teacher, why I wanted to teach kids. And I, you know, I don't know what episode I inserted the little phrase in my intro where I say, you know, remember, you know, we're teaching, we're teaching kids music rather than, or we're teaching, we're using music to teach kids or something. What I say, be your best. You know, I don't know what my catchphrase is. I can't remember. But, um, the idea of putting the kids first and using music as a vehicle to teach kids as opposed to teaching music to kids, you know, it's, I think that's really, a big part of what I've learned. One of my, um, one of my close colleagues here in Howard County, um, and I'll shout her out, Carolyn Friel, cause she's a very, very close friend of mine. She is a, a choral high school choral director here. And she, I think I like I like her wording cause it's like the wording. Sometimes someone will like write or speak something that's like in your brain, you know, and mm-hmm. you just didn't know that anyone was thinking about it in quite that language. But I, I remember she phrased it. Um, she was got our, our like districts, like educator of the year award a number of years ago. And uh, she said like her, her kind of her primary aim, if I'm par- I'm kind of paraphrasing her, but she said like teaching, teaching kids how to hear. And she sort of equated that to like actually the skill of listening on a fine degree, um, which connected with me because like so much of my teaching philosophy is based on audiating. Um, and having a concept of sound, but then she said, but also like listening to their world and like what the skill of listening to something in a fine level of detail help, how it helps you to shape your perspective of like the things that are surrounding you. And that just a, like has such a wide reaching and wide ranging, um, degree of applications for like who you are as a human being when you like understand how to enter into a space, understand how to have empathy towards another human being who's talking to you, um, understand how to be sensitive to like, other worldviews like i just to me it like captured how um performing is just you know it's the thing that i personally have studied at the highest level as you know i have a master's degree in percussion performance but i like i don't to me it's not i have i have like to me it could be any lots of different vehicles <laughs> that could get us right, there right this, i just feel right. like i've developed at this point in my career the most skill around like teaching in the performing arts environment mm-hmm. particularly middle school but i was always going to be a teacher I was always going to be a teacher. Both my parents were teachers. My father taught for like 55 years. Um, I was, it was just always what I wanted to do from the time I was little. And I thought I was going to be a history teacher until I got like my junior year of high school. Then I thought, well, maybe this music thing might work out. So I could have been a history teacher. I could have had the, the history teacher podcast. <laughs> I don't know. Right. So, you know, I, again, it's, it's the, the teaching is more about, is more than the subject you teach. But it's, you know what, one thing you said about music, which is really interesting, is you use the word space. I think spatial awareness in, in space is a big part of being a musician in so many ways, as you mentioned. I mean, I always, I always feel like music's very much more like geometry than it is algebra. You know, it's understanding distances and relationships. And I mean, someone out there who's a maths person is going to be like, why are there <laughs> you know, yelling at me? I'm not a math person, so. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It totally, totally is. Yeah. I think I'm trying to like, we're at this point now in some of my music classes, cause I also teach general music as well. And I'm trying to like explain rhythm, like it, you know, you can get, you can have really good rhythm and not understand <laughs> rhythm at all. Mm-hmm. I'm learning. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. I'm trying to explain to my general music class, like why I'm like, why, why the quarter note shouldn't like move in the same pace as the eighth note does one measure later mm-hmm. when you play jingle bells <laughs> on the piano. And I'm like, mm-hmm. All right, so like here's a painting, and I show a Google image for painting. And I'm like, do you see how there's like space between these two elephants in the painting? Well, like imagine that that things can be like painted over time <laughs> instead. Right. And they're yeah, just like, yeah, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. So like, yeah. 
So like the space between the impulses of each note of Jingle Bells, um, make it Jingle Bells or not, or varying degrees of accuracy to what Jingle Bells is. And they're just like, we, we think we get it. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm doing my best here, y'all. But yeah, no, it is. I, I almost wonder because, you know, I do, I use Darcy Williams as teaching rhythm logically with my fourth and fifth graders to start them out with rhythm. I almost wonder you could use a day in music appreciation and do teaching rhythm logically for a day because we, I teach it to 10 year olds, nine year olds. So, um, I mean, you know, it really shows immediately what the difference between rhythm and beat is. The cool thing yeah. is like we have, we have now like as part of our, like our district pays for sound trap for every student mm-hmm. in our, you know, oh, so, yeah. and then in this general music class. And this is like a game changer for general music, which is something that from, I would say at this point in my career, most, most of the years I've been a teacher, I've had at least one general music class in my schedule. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, general music is like, you know, we're now, th- these are the tools that a lot of the musical styles we explore are natively created in. So like we're studying pop songs and like until like just a few years ago, we didn't have any tools to really make the music using the same techniques. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm getting, I'm having some success with the piano roll and the ruler and soundtrap. Um, there's a cool, actually, uh, I guess I'll link it into the notes of this episode. Um, I found, gosh, I wish I could credit this person. I'll do it in the notes, but, um, I found a cool Google sheet that someone made and shared. It was, I don't even remember where I found it, but it basically like has a bunch of different melodic and rhythmic ideas sort of in a staff and in a piano roll side by side in a somewhat Mm -hmm. editable way. So you can kind of connect that in in there. Mm Mm-hmm. We're getting there. Yeah, I, I taught Soundtrap for the two years during the pandemic. And, um, you know, the th- one thing I learned really early on is you actually still have to teach the music fundamentals really diligently because Soundtrap is still just a tool. It doesn't do anything magically for the kids. I mean, they can create rhythms really quickly, you know, with the drum loops. They can use the loops to create, you know, songs, but there's not sections because they don't understand how to how to do anything larger scale than sure, just yeah. a couple seconds of a loop. Yeah. It's interesting. And, I've been thinking uh, about this a lot lately with technology's role because like technology does sometimes makes the barrier to entry low enough that it opens up. I've been thinking about this because we don't have to talk about artificial intelligent art to, today if you don't want to, but every time <laughs> there's a new technology that comes out, it's like, it almost like makes the craft accessible to a lot more people. Um, but like you still have to like know what to do with it. You still have to have some intuitive sense and some learning that's happened and before you can make meaningful, you know, so like, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm just looking you know, sound soundtrap does like for those first couple of lessons where you're just dragging loops around, you are kind of like instantly getting to something that sounds mm-hmm. satisfying mm-hmm. quicker. But like the second that you ask a group of seventh or even eighth graders to like structure those in like a form, like a B a, like you gotta really, you gotta do the teaching. <laughs> Yeah, they fall apart at that moment. And it took me, it's so funny, I taught it for two years, and I was going to teach it again as an elective this year, but I had an opportunity to take my middle school band from two days a week to three days a week, but it means that I'm not going to be here on the day that they offer that elective. So I gave it up, which is kind of a little disappointing because I just felt like I was just getting my curriculum to where I felt like maybe I'd have some success with it because it's always like you, you get, you show them the loops, they're excited for about two or three weeks. You know, and then you get to that moment where you have to start teaching them fundamentals and they're like, uh, oh, grown, we don't like this. Mm-hmm. And then of course you lose some of the kids on the fringe at that point. You know, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're doing so, also, our, I helped rewrite our general music to curriculum, which is like the second level for middle school. And, mm-hmm. um, and I was just like writing soundtrack lessons, you know, um, that was mm-hmm. kind of like my, my input, but you know, one, one of the other teachers writing the curriculum is really like has had a lot of success with doing the modern band thing. So we got these method books. Mm-hmm. It's like a bass method book, piano, guitar, mm-hmm. drums, and everybody, they have all the same songs in them. And we're playing through this piano method book and like the chord diagrams are like not on a staff. So they're just like the piano, but like grayed out. And so we're having instance, it's like, oh, we're learning so many chords because we have this nice pretty diagram. And then we get to, um, I forget, I feel like it was a Maroon 5 song or something like the, da, 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 and they're like, so excited. They're like, okay, we're going to do this. And all of a sudden they're like, wait, how do I finger this so that it sounds yeah. like the song? And I'm like, yeah, see, so like you're, <laughs> no matter how, what, how you enter, um, you got to like, at some point, there has to be some, you know, in this case, performance skill that enters into the equation. So, you know, there's, there's two models that I studied, um, about teaching kind of soundtrack or electronic music to kids. And, and the one is the, um, what's it? The shed, 
you know, that, that Mm -hmm. program, the shed. Yep. Um, I can't think of his name and he's all about like, he, he took apart all these pop songs when he put his curriculum together, he was like analyzing songs and he's all about teaching the kids to like play drum patterns you know, with their hands on the numeric pad and then he makes them learn chord progressions. So he's really, that whole program is about fundamentals to get to where you can do electronic music. And then there's uh the other fellow who's in uh, Southern Ohio. He uses Ableton. And so he's, he's able to Will build Coon. chords. Boss, Bob Hattersat is the, the yeah, chef. yeah, yeah, yeah. Bob and Will Coon. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, these Will, two Will Coon has been a uh, multiple time guest on this show. And is, uh, Oh, okay. Okay. He uses Ableton, right? Yeah. Get, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, his program's amazing. That that's like. <laughs> so I'm here. I'm talking about these guys, and they've been on your show. Yeah, well, I haven't had. I have. I gotta <laughs> have Bob on at some point. Will Will has been on numerous times. We've like kind of presented at various state level oh, okay. things across the country. He's but amazing. he's his sessions are are good fun because um you know his approach and actually his his approach to teaching the digital audio workstation really resonates with me in the band room because I just I can as much as I'm doing with. So I'm doing a lot, as as you probably assume, with technology, like in general. But like a lot of it is like just how I'm using it. Uh, it's only really like in that general music classroom where I'm thinking about the student facing aspect because there truly has until Soundtrap was in our hands for every student. There was not really a lot I felt like I could do with student sure. technology. Sure. Um, so well, it was all notation software, which is a barrier. It is, and we can maybe get into that in a second. But <laughs> so I. <laughs> But what I, what I really do love about how Will does things and you can see, and he kind of like structures his presentations in the same way is, um, you know, when he, when he, he's all about like demystifying the subject, but mm-hmm. like sort of like taking away every bit, making it as seem as easy as possible. And there's actually like a sincere amount of work that you have to do, especially in his, in like, and for him, it's all like he's using, you know, files on a computer and like dealing with like kind of audio samples and things. So for him, it's like all of this prep work, getting the, the project file mm-hmm. template set up so that there's like, so that they're only really looking at the one objective for that assignment and that nothing yeah. else is going to get in their way or distract them. And I, it's really not that different, even though I'm fairly, tr- you know, I, I do teach that aspect in general music, like I said, but I'm, I have, I'm a fairly traditional in some respects about how I teach band, but there mm-hmm. is that aspect. Like you have to remove every, everything, you know, from choosing the right repertoire all the way to like having them just really focusing on like making a good sound before you can really, accomplish move forward like all of it is that same thing sort of de- or, and even just like connecting idea you know phrasing ideas and stylistic ideas to them emotionally in a way that they can understand like you have to demystify all of these kind of abstract concepts for them i feel like it's pr- it's kind of like the core part it's the core creative aspect of the job for me is like how do i mm-hmm. take them from the the unknown to the known like what am i gonna how do i yeah. do that well i think one of the one of the most important teaching skills, and I think it's a mark of all great teachers is the ability to parse a topic into smaller parts so that the kids can learn the smaller parts and then stack them up. And, you know, in a way that we can then begin to create larger things out of them. I think, I mean, maybe that's obvious, but (laughs) the best teachers I had have been so good at that. You know, I had a piano teacher, in college, he was, he was actually a friend of Karl Orff's. He emigrated from Germany after World War II. And he, you know, he would, he, I remember he taught me how to do the, um, the first invention from the well tempered clavier, the, um, not the well tempered clavier, the invention books. Yeah. 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 And, the C you know, major the, one. The one that's in C major. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And so he had all these exercises that had all the patterns, the finger patterns for that piece, but they were in different keys and different contexts. And so we would kind of learn them. And then he pulled that piece out and said, okay, so now here's that pattern. Here's that pattern. Here's that pattern. And I was able to put it together so much more quickly than if I'd sat and started on measure one and started to bang out because it's all motive based anyway. And so he was able to parse that whole piece out in a way that I could get it under my fingers in a very short amount of time. It was amazing. I'll never forget that. It was like magic. Yeah, it really is the skill. It's, it's one of these things too. It's like you, um, I'm one of the things I'm challenging myself with is like, how do I keep that interesting? Mm-hmm. Because there is for performing, you know, these are, these are like muscular skill. Like what, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the first step for me is like, how do I train the mind? Like how is the, how does the concept, mm-hmm. you know, the Dan, I think of Daniel Kohut's like teaching music, performance book mm-hmm. like developing the superior concept and then yep. once you develop that you do have to like train your body to 
repeat something a lot of times so it gets the sound mm-hmm. that's in your head. It's and, hard. It's hard with young beginners too, because I know what a superior sounds like a superior sound sounds like, but we can't spend two years just doing long tones. Right. You know, it's just, it's, so there's a balance there all the time. You know, it's so funny that you would say that it was just this week where I was playing with my beginners long tones and they played the first five notes back to me without me having to like force feed them the, the fingerings, you know? And I was like, okay, we're ready. We're taking out the book on Monday, you know? Yeah. And they actually were a little disappointed. They were like, oh no. Cause you know, they were going to add a, a little more difficulty. They were having success. And of course you keep moving the rabbit out in front a little farther. The carrot, I guess is a more appropriate. I have a beagle, so everything's about rabbits. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, my, my, my hack, I don't know if I would call it a hack. I don't know. Hack, to me, hack is not derogatory. It just means like a fun way, a fun way to cha- tackle a problem. You know, I don't feel like I'm cheating by any means, but, um, and this is particularly helpful in my concert band class. And, and the thing about middle schools, I mean, we do, you know, our kids, they play 50 minutes a day, you know, they, they have their instruments mm-hmm. out and that's, that's huge, you know, just the, mm-hmm. the sheer amount of play time they get. And so we can do some repetition, um, but keeping that interesting is certainly a challenge. And so I have just like, Oh, exhausted my knowledge of like <laughs> play along material. Uh-huh. And this is like the thing I made a bunch of play along tracks with trap beats and like justly in tune tuning drones from the Yamaha harmony director, sort of like, mm-hmm. so there's like a 808 bass. It's, so it's all these fun tracks that like reinforce the intonation and the rhythm. Sure. Um, I've modeled them after the found some of them after the foundations for superior performance book, which I don't think, I don't feel mm-hmm. like you can copyright. Da, 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 da. So I feel pretty good. You know, saying that. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think scales can and arpeggios can be copywritten, but I don't know. Led Zeppelin, <laughs> <laughs> they won that case. They did. They did. <laughs> we could, we could go there. Um, yeah, but no, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where the music theorist in me gets outraged. But anyway, I sure. <laughs> Anyway, I think play along tracks are, are cool, especially when they're loud. Mm-hmm. Um, I, have you ever, I don't know if you've ever done anything with band in a box because that's like my – if they get tired of my – because um, it took me a really long time to make the – because I put, made them in all, you know, yeah. all 12 keys. But like so if they get tired of my trap beats, I put tonal energy through one mm-hmm. channel of the mixer and then I get – have you ever done band in a box before? Mm-mm, no. I was so hesitant. It's kind of expensive, but I have a Patreon for this. And one of my like perks is that I have like a special Discord channel in our Discord mm-hmm. that – and like someone in the discord was like, I was like, Hey, I'm going to like do a zoom, like a live Twitch thing for people who support the show, which, which I do and band in a box was, and I was like, well, I mean, I'm like, you know, making like a few dollars off this Patreon. I'll just buy band in a box. So I did. And I, you know, I, it's, it looks like software that should run on windows 95, yep. but, it is, <laughs> but it, it is actually, I think, very, isn't that what it, I mean, it's old. I remember yeah, back in the nineties. I don't think it does. I mean, maybe I shouldn't be mean, but like, I, it does, I don't know if like a, like a interface designer has like looked at it in a while, but it's, <laughs> but the tech, the, what it does with audio is like actually really profound. It's got that whole thing like that, you know, apps like the iReal Pro, you know, like where you can kind of like customize the chord symbols in a sequence. But what it does is, is the play along tracks, especially the ones that are real audio samples, not MIDI are nuts. Like you can have one that's like, all right, here's like a, five piece swing ensemble with trombone soloist and then whatever chord progression you have even if it's something like for for the band music <laughs> yeah, like sure enough the trombonist will a real trombone player will solo over every chord change that you put in there and mm-hmm. uh i think it's pr- pretty nuts so we we do a different style every day when we are repeating non-stop our Right now, we're doing the fanfare heroica by Brian Balmages. So we're, mm-hmm. it's just, it's a lot of sing, buzz, play, sing, buzz, play, sometimes finger, buzz, play. And, you know, Band in a Box has like hundreds of, of different kinds of patterns. So, you know, today was like bluegrass day and yesterday was contemporary pop day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of the the software. I I'm just like maybe I just shouldn't have been sanding and thinking more about this interview because I can't remember anything right now. Um, but there's a, a website that I use sometimes that has uh, chord progressions, and so like you could look up a song and it'll have the chords for that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, Theory something. Like you mean like a like a pop song like a or yeah 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 like a, like different pop songs so. Like if you look up Billy Jean, it'll have the chord progression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and then it'll have the chord progression. And that's got a tool where you can plug in chord changes. Oh, that's cool. And play over it. That's a really cool site. It's got a feed to it, but that's a cool site. I think of the I'll, like the guitar tab ones, and then there's the one that the Muse Group has, which is I think what is Muse Group's guitar thing. Um, so they have Ultimate Guitar. Um, cause I think like the kind of site you're describing doesn't, uh, well, I mean, I think any kind of guitar like tab or chord website would have that minus the plugin thing that you're just right. Right. No, this is, um, this is a little bit more, um, involved in that. I like iReal Pro a lot. You know, I, I, and I haven't like really kept up to date and I made, made some more software packs. Um, but I get so much mileage out of it, you know, and especially I use it a little bit more in my private lessons where we're like really getting more into the. Some of some of the jazz musicians will like maybe gasp at me saying scale the- chord and scale theory because I know it's, <laughs> so it's a hot it's I feel like it's it's like a it's like a naughty it's almost like a naughty word like it's something that I feel like you have to know but it's also like you know not like a good improviser is not like thinking about scales and chords as much as like a melodic right. shape or a phrasing right. idea so I right. I hesitate. I don't know if I'm allowed to say chord theory, but at a certain part of the day, you do have to learn your scales. If you're gonna, <laughs> so you do, you do. Um, I have lots of thoughts on the the utility of theory in certain parts of theory, but that mostly has to do with the undergrad curriculum and not what we call fundamentals. You know. Well, I, I mean, you know, fundam- I, yeah, go ahead. The fundamentals are always useful, but yeah. Anyway, I'll stop. <laughs> Well, I, mean, I mean, like my jazz theory, I didn't take a jazz theory course until I was a graduate student. And I was, it was such a breath of fresh air because, um, and maybe, and maybe I'm lucky, maybe this is not the typical kind of thing, but I, the theory teachers I had were really grounded in the, in the aspect of like, um, not, not only improvising, but also arranging. So there was always some sort of attitude about understanding like how real music worked when you understood a chord or an extension or a voicing, um, everything. I mean, and I was in the class, you know, I mean, I was, it was very new to me, even though I was like a graduate student, but there were, you know, like military band musicians take, like taking the class who had been, mm-hmm. you know, playing jazz their whole life. And, you know, they're hearing a chord and they're like, Oh yeah, I hear the, the sharp 11th and the sharp nine <laughs> in the trombone, first and second trombone. And I'm like, cool, man, that's great. And eventually I got closer to being able to hear some of that stuff. Yeah. 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 But but you hear that and it's like okay well that's kind of cool though it's a lot different when you actually like understand how the nature of the music is formed by that knowledge mm-hmm. than uh, everything is associated with the ear I mean no, nobody gave me that opportunity in like my theory one hundred and one class like I had to personally go home and poke out the six chords on the piano mm-hmm. until I understood what they sounded like. Yep. Yep. And that's a real problem because, you know, that's one of the things I, I stopped teaching theory before Soundtrap became a thing. I'd love to go back and teach college music theory with Soundtrap in my toolkit. I think that would be a uh, pretty cool because then, you know, we can actually do some, some really quick and easy, you know, everyone on their laptop or whatever device they have and, you know, do some really quick and easy examples of these chord progressions that aren't just four part writing that they can't play at the piano. And they, you know, we, we don't hear them that much, you know? So I just think maybe we, we, you know, music theory is taught from the top down. It's taught from notation down. Whereas most music is made from the bottom up. It's made from the sound to the notation. Yeah. I think, and and that's just like, Sometimes that attitude is simply about the presentation of like, sometimes it all it takes is for someone in front of a classroom to say exactly what you just said to change. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I, I mean, my sophomore year of high school music theory class, it was like when we started doing the counterpoint, it was like, these are the rules. And I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> you know what though? I'm going to just, I'm going to play the devil's advocate on this one because the rules, yeah, the rules is a terrible way of saying it. That, that word causes more problems for theorists than any other. They're not rules for how to write music. They're rules for how to write music in this style. That, but that the was rules that make, right. The rules that make this one style work. Jazz has a different set of rules. <laughs> It was so well, that's what that's right. Yeah. right. It was not presented that way. It was like these are the rules, and when you're right, you know, right. you know the, the younger you are, the more kind of like the less kind of room for like gray area you have in your mind. So I mean, yeah. I got to tell you though, those rules, man. I write beginning band music, and those rules really matter for beginning band music because you can tell when they're broken. <laughs> you know, you right. know as well as I do when you play a, a tune where there's like lots of parallels. It's like oh, I'm not so sure. You know, the counterpoint isn't clean or whatever. I don't know. Maybe that's just me because I'm a geek about it, but you know, no, I think it's good. Actually, let me, 
Let me ask you this: since I'm since I'm in a moment, so we were talking to Phil, like just sort of philosophically earlier. Like I'm I'm always with my concert band trying to program the easiest possible music. I actually my favorite tradition every fall is one of our elementary schools who feeds into us is I go to her school the first week and I I say, all right, what are you gonna what are you going to play on your fourth grade winter uh, concert this year? Cause that's sure. what I need for the sixth grade band this year. And I raid her, her closet. And it's like, for me, it's things that use really just like maybe five or six notes that have really, uh-huh. um, I mean, you know, the characteristics of like, what's the easiest yeah. way you can start to develop a sound and like, just start breaking into, we're doing more than one thing at a time in the music. Like what, and I guess the questions, I take a long time to ask questions. What, what's your, what is one of your favorite pieces that you've composed that you would say meets that criteria? Cause I have, will admit to you, I've never played anything by you in my band. So, well, it depends what, what so a, ask the question again, you, do you mean like an absolute beginning piece or a piece where there's a, a, a change in level for the kids where they have to achieve something different? I mean, more like I, I a beginning like, piece, something, some, something where there's like more than one pitch happening harmonically at a time, but that there's not really, but that's like the level we've just broken out of unison and playing. Maybe there's like one or like two or three notes happening at a time, maybe two or three voices. Right. Well, you know, I think that's a pretty big step for kids. Um, and I think that's one of the spots where you find composers and, and myself included where we miss the mark a lot right there. So for example, I have a piece, um, that's really very beginning. I would call it like grade quarter. It's called Two Songs for the Holidays. It's very much like Beethoven's Ninth by Paul Lavender or, you know, uh, Penguin Promenade or pieces like that that are really for beginners, like absolute beginners. And so it's mostly homophonic rhythmically. You know, it's got maybe some light harmony, but there's no real counterpoint per se. And so to get to that next counterpoint level is really difficult because it gets into you know, playing independently and also being able to, you know, negotiate having different parts and, you know, trombones and flutes are a problem in beginning bands. Right. And so <laughs> you have, you have struggles. So as far as things I've written, I don't know if I've had a piece where I really feel like, Oh man, that's a really great grade one half piece, but I do have some pieces like in that grade one, grade two level that I think are really great, but I don't think yeah. I've hit that one. I don't think I've hit that sweet spot in that one. That's right where you're talking about. Cause I think that is like super hard to hit. I'll actually, I'll rephrase that. Sense? It's actually the, yeah, it totally makes sense. It's actually the, the point two fives I'm looking for. <laughs> it's that, it's that level of like, okay, well, oh, okay. Yeah. I, I feel have, like, we're, yeah. I only have one at that level that's published. It's the two songs for the holidays. Um, I think it's up on the housetop and oh, another one. I guess it's so funny. I can't remember. I, <laughs> but you know, time flies. And, right, sure. You know, I haven't listened to it in a bit. And um, I'm actually doing one now um, where I'm doing a couple lines in a method book, and I'm going to do it for um, what Michael Murphy's doing. He's got his beginning band flex series, but I want to do it like a true multi-level piece. I want to have it lines in a method book. So it's going to be like go tell Aunt Rody, and it's going to be go tell Aunt Rody for the beginners. But it's also going to have a part that has harmony that might be for the students who are maybe a little bit more advanced. But it's also going to have a part because I teach at a school that's fourth through eighth grade. So when I'm, when things are cooking for me, I've got a fourth grade band that's beginners, a fifth grade band that's advanced beginners, and then a middle school band that's playing grade one and a half to two ish music because I only meet twice a week with them. And so I don't get to the grade three or four in middle school with my kids. But anyway, that's beside the point. But I always want to have a piece on the concert where everyone plays. So I'm creating a piece where I'm going to have literally multi levels where you have one, two, and three, and they are different grade levels of music. Um, so that's something I'm working on right now. It's going to be like, go tell Aunt Rody. It's going to be, you know, Ode to Joy, those kind of things that are like, yeah, yeah, you know, lines 25 in the method book. You know what I mean? Right. I love that concept. I, let me throw another concept at you that I, this is like my, consider this my first ever public petition for something from a, <laughs> from composers okay. and publishers everywhere. Shoot. Okay. Lay it so, on me. So I told you there's a couple of ways I've totally changed my teaching since we, you know, mm-hmm. we were doing, when we were doing the online thing, it was like, I was, I was basically like a spin instructor, not a band director. I was like pumping tracks through the <laughs> Google meet and I was go, go, go band. And we're just all in our yeah, rooms, yeah. like yeah, in yeah. our beds. Tootin and, doing, and the, so, doing the Brady Bunch recordings, right? Or Hollywood exactly. Squares. Yeah, we're just that's just what we're doing, and I'm like, okay, like I can't. It's so hard to give feedback possible, but like not great. And, and so we got back, and I was like, wow, we because of the lost year, 
Um, last year, I in the like you know, like I said, my first order of business was go to the local elementary school band directors and say like, "What's the easiest stuff in your library? I'm gonna play it." Take it to the band, and then I was like, "Okay, how do I sell this?" So I first had to pick the, just the funnest music that was like the easiest music. So I find mm-hmm. that, get them pumped about that, and then it was still some of it was just too it was just too much even to like have two different parts happening at once in the music. Um, mm-hmm. So what I did was I and I have a couple of colleagues who have experimented with this. So I try what I did was I took started taking the pieces that the concert band plays, and I wrote out everybody's part for every instrument with solfege underneath of it. And then I basically printed out a practice guide for them. And then I pumped my loud previously mentioned beat tracks through the thing. And we sang and buzzed and we just played every single note of every single piece for our fall concert in unison together until we had that sort of strength in numbers impact, that effect. Uh, and it helped dramatically with the intonation and the tone um, mm-hmm. to the point where, and, and then it's like, there's so many side benefits too. Now the tuba player gets to play melody all time, like the whole time. Mm-hmm. Everybody is playing constantly. Like if I need to address the flutes in measure 37, everybody can play it, not just the flutes. Like, so like I can, I had a headset mic that I bought a few years ago. So now I'm like walking around the room and like being in everyone's business, being present. And like, I am kind of a spin instructor, but an in-person spin instructor who can give yeah. feedback. And yeah. I, as I continue to do that this school year, it continues to be one of the most successful changes to my early band teaching ever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it takes a very long time to make the resources. So, and I know that somebody yeah. has got that Sibelius or Dorica or whatever. So that, someone's computer has that on it. <laughs> and I just, mm-hmm. all it would be take is a co- some copy and pasting. Um, well, that's kind of what I'm trying to do with the piece I was talking about. I mean, basically, you know, you can play it as a grade half, you know, with your band, or you can play it with a grade half and a grade one if you want to add a little more complexity to it. But that's kind of what I was thinking was yeah. along those lines, because I know exactly what you're talking about. One of the pieces, and you had asked me a little bit earlier why I might use Adobe Acrobat, and one of the, the resources I use as a guest I had on the show, Matthew Provino, who teaches at, um, I think, Sierra Vista Middle School in Los Angeles, um, he wrote a method book. And it's absolutely free for anyone who wants to get it. You just go to his website and you can download each part. And at number 52 in his method book is a four part twinkle, twinkle little star. And Matthew wrote it in invertible counterpoint. So you can have all the players play line a, which is the melody. And then you can say, all right, pick a line, play whatever line you want. And then a, B, C, or D, they all work no matter what instrument chooses it. And it's just so fantastic. It's it's the first time that I really let them have any sort of independence and where they're playing in complete now it's all homophonic. There's no there's no contrapuntal rhythm, but it's but you know, it's it's four part harmony and, and they get to choose what part they want and you know, so I just let them do that for a couple weeks before the concert and then the day the rehearsal before the concert I just say, All right, who wants to play part A tonight? Who wants to play part B tonight? Who wants to play part C tonight? And we just play it. And they love it. They love it. Yeah, it's all that's so. that's so awesome. And there's so much opportunity to teach balance too through that because you can mm-hmm. say like, all right, you're, you play can play all these parts. Do you hear all mm-hmm. the parts happening right now? Yeah, and they they know all the parts because at some point or another they've tried them because they want to try them. And you know, it becomes a little game. Oh, Susie's playing line C. I want to play that too, you know, or you know, so they start to do that thing. Um and so it's a great thing. I, Matthew just created, that's a tremendous resource for beginning band directors to have a free method book that you can use to supplement your other method, because we all know you don't teach lines one through 70, you know, in order you're jumping around and you're using re- other resources. And I love that book for that because it's got such, such accessible things that I can use to supplement what I use as my printed published method book. Sure. Yeah. So many people are making great stuff. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that's the thing is like how, you know, keeping that kind of unison, the unison playing, you know, is can be repetitive, but finding more resources like that is one of the ways that I can maybe keep it interesting for longer. Yeah. And there's that, there's that theory thing again, right? Being able to write four parts, <laughs> right? You know, invertible counterpoints, maybe a little trickier, but it's still within most, if you were successful in college music theory, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, well, I'm writing my own stuff. I mean, so I'm like a, technically like arranging these works for the band. I guess you could call it arranging. Um, but I, you know, I, this is the, yeah, like writing my own material is certainly like maybe an evolution of that. I don't know. Well, mm-hmm. I'm not quite there yet. 
Yeah, you know, we go back to the college curriculum thing. It's one of my things that I really wish I, if I had any regret in my career leaving college teaching is that I didn't have enough time to make more of an impact on that curriculum. I feel like now that I'm back as a high, as a, a band director again, I'm happier, but I have regrets that it, there's so many things there that I feel like I left unfinished. And one of them was really pushing the people who are involved in theory pedagogy at the national level, pushing them to be more proactive about creating musicians who are more in tune with the 20th, 21st century, as opposed to the Western canon, as it were. And I know there's plenty of theory teachers out there who are making these changes and changing their curriculum. And, but I just feel like there's not enough because I think every teacher should be able to arrange music. Every teacher should know how to play over the blues. Every teacher should know the structure of a pop song and be able to teach a pop you know, how to write a pop song. These are things that I didn't necessarily get when I was an undergrad. It was all about the Western canon. And so I had a, you know, it wasn't until I actually left college that I actually learned how a pop song worked. That's just ludicrous to me. It took me so long. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I I got into it with another teacher once who was like, ask, basically asking for this. Like I didn't ever learn how to play like a G7 chord. Like the first time I had to teach one in general music, I was like, I play the flute. Like what is a G7 chord? I, and I, and I'm like, yeah, exactly. And it's sad. I mean, I had a pretty decent jazz background, but still. Yeah. And I, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, why was this not hard for me? And I'm like, okay, well, there's a couple of aspects to this. Like I had the, like, you know, first of all, like I got to like the fact that I got to like do grad school right away. Like that's a very distinctive privilege that I specifically had in my life. Um, but also like, I don't know, lots of life experiences when like, I mean, I grew up like playing guitar and like backing up like the church band growing up too. And I'm like, that's a really, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the kind of yeah. thing that you just like, it's just a part of you uh-huh. and you realize yeah. how much that has actually shaped you. All of that yep. wrote like amateur musicianship, like just playing in community with people, but like a lot. A lot. <laughs> but that's the- how, that's how most of the world's musicians learn. It's only this very specific Western North American tradition that values the conservatory model. I mean, most musical cultures learn by rote. It's crazy that we don't do more of it. Yeah. Well, I've, I've embraced a little bit of it in, at yeah. least in the band classroom. I mean, that's why trying to have them sing as much as possible, getting, getting the audiation to happen. I actually, I don't know if this was like, I, some, I, I, I might need to backpedal this decision, but I, as kind of as a joke, like that we have a new choir director. And I thought it would be fun. You know, we were sitting in the flute section all today and someone couldn't match a pitch. And I jokingly told him, I was like, I think, I think our choir director can help. And I said, as a joke, I just to go say hi to her. I said, as a joke, he comes back and he's like, she's invited me to the next choir section. <laughs> she's, <I'm> like, <laughs> um, so, um, you know, trying to, uh, yeah, I mean, there's just something about like, and I think that actually that choir does even, even with, Still, definitely a lot of that kind of um, Western and conservatory attitude that there's a lot there's there's lots of room for change there, too. But I think there is something to it. Like, you know, I got something out of my high school choir experience that I didn't get out of my band experience. And mm-hmm. um, we were we were singing with like a higher degree of like musical skill, technical skill, listening. But I, I but I re- recall the feeling I had when I left the rehearsal as much more similar to a lot of the outside of school music making experiences I had growing up. Um, it's interesting. Like my, yeah. My heavy metal garage band or like, you know, <laughs> in, in any one of those other things. I, you know, I only, the first time I ever did choir was when I had to do it for the choral conducting course in college. We had to take a semester of choir. And um, then I found out the next semester they were going to do um, the Mozart Requiem. And the choir was going to sing with the orchestra and I wasn't one of the trumpets in the orchestra. So I was all in on the choir to sing the Mozart Requiem, (laughs) which was, by the way, an awesome friggin' experience to sing bass on, you know, confutatis. It was, that was, that was a peak experience, um, music wise. That's awesome. But, um, I do think, I think choir is a really interesting and it's a lot, almost like playing the brass quintet in, in some ways, something about that perfect intonation you know, not that Pythagorean intonation that's not the, um, you know, the well-tempered or the even-tempered. There's something about singing in that Pythagorean tuning and, and in a choir or in a brass quintet or in a string quartet. There's just something that's really sort of primal about that music-making experience. And I don't know if I'm actually kind of addressing what we were talking about, but just that feeling coming out is an amazing thing. I, I, I kind of get what you mean. 
I'm a tuning nerd too, so I'm I'm you're speaking my language, and you're you're making me recall a memory that I like. It's it's in it's it's part of the way that I teach intonation, but it's not something I've recalled recently until you just said that. Like we we actually did like our our high school choir director would teach us to hear the difference between the way a fifth rang on the piano and the way she wanted us to sing it. She would like teach us to mm. understand the way it resonated. You know, it was like it's just like a little like richer and brighter when it's like a little more open, and and like that is that is something that. You know, is you, you that we did, and uh, I don't know. Can I can I geek out on a recent experience I had? Totally. So I was able to do the St. Louis Symphony offers a side by side concert where they invite music educators to play with the musicians. That's awesome on stage. They're the only professional orchestra in the United States that does it. And so anyone from a professional orchestra who's listening, go look at the St. Louis side by side concert. It's an amazing opportunity for the educators. But I got to sit on stage with the um, with the trumpet players from the St. Louis Symphony and. And that orchestra is really good. They're not slouches at that place, you know. And so it was amazing for the experience. We did the Holst Planets. But I got to play first trumpet on um, the Largo from the New World Symphony. And now listen, I it's got 11 notes. So there was, <laughs> you know, the first trumpet part wasn't anything that was, like, tricky. But there's a moment in that piece where it's really loud. And then all the winds and brass and percussion drop out and it's just like a string choir at the end and it's so perfectly in tune they switch from that equal temperament to that pythagorean and you, the overtones ring out so richly from within the ensemble it's almost like you hear a choir singing and it's all strings it is so it's like i get goosebumps thinking about it it's just so amazing when that happens and that doesn't happen with equal temperament no, there's too many beats. <laughs> yeah. Going yeah. On in the air. <laughs> My goodness. But every time, especially in the performance, it was like, I kept looking around like, is there a choir somewhere? Because yeah. it sounded like voices. It was so pure. Yeah. It's really I, awesome. Zara, it just, it was, it was incredible. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. And well, speaking to the like rote learning and the listening and developing these, ad, you know, these, these ideas. I mean, like, I really like this, this kind of stuff is teachable. I think even to the youngest kids, you know, I think you can definitely, mm -hmm. like, I, I have, you know, th things get murky with like how many of my, even my eighth graders can understand like raising the fifth and lowering the third. I try not to really get into it too much, but they absolutely can't mm -hmm. hear it if you pump the tuning drone mm -hmm. loud enough. Um, I, you know, I teach kick the third sli valve slide out from day one with the trumpets. It's not, it's not something I wait until a year is in, you know, they don't all do it well. and It can sometimes be a hot mess, but, you know, it makes an already difficult note more difficult. But you know what I mean? It's you cool. have to teach it early on. Yeah. And yeah. kids can hear tuning like the youngest kids can tell. Like if I if I have a clarinet in my hand and I play for a young clarinetist and they don't have their their tongue back and, you know, that they, they don't have the right embouchure with the you know, they can hear how flat they are relative to me. And I can say, pull your tongue back, you know, hiss, and you'll hear the pitch go up. And they hear it, too. And you see their eyes get bigger as they slowly crawl up to match that pitch. So they can do it. They yeah, can do it. Totally. They totally can. Trump, young trombone players do it. They do it instinctively. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not always, of course. <laughs> you know, there's always there's always the one. <laughs> Well, I mean, but that, those are the fun kids. I, those are the ones I, I kind of I like. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Today, I would like to introduce you to my scale exercise play along tracks with trap beats available for sale at RobbieBurns.com. Trap beat playalongs include over 72 audio recordings, each of which includes a count off, a trap beat at 70 beats per minute, and a tuning drone playing both the tonic and each note of the scale in just intonation so your ensemble can learn to play in tune, develop steady, sustained tone, and blend with other sounds. These drones are stacked over top engaging trap beats that help students to practice at slower tempos while developing steadiness of time and a better concept of how the beat is subdivided. The scale exercises include whole notes, half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, scale and thirds, and a mini scale with an arpeggio at the end in all 12 keys. I've also included three speed variations of a Remington exercise, 
So band ensembles can work on their favorite tone and technical exercises, whether they be from a method book or of your own invention. The tracks are $15, but for $40, you can get the stems to the tracks in Logic Pro and GarageBand format so that you can do things like speed them up and slow them down, change the pitch, add your own accompaniment, take out my voice and add your own. And two and three and go. Or even sequence the tracks together to completely automate your ensemble warm-up. These tracks are perfect for running through your Google Meet, Zoom, or virtual teaching platform of choice, or for running through the loudspeakers at the beginning of your in-person rehearsal. Check them out now at robbyburns.com slash store. I have a theory that there's three aspects to a student. There's, um, and I don't want to call it natural ability because I don't feel like that captures exactly the right thing I'm trying to say, but there's like right. a certain amount of like, um, so, oh, I'll just, I'll just explain that one last. So there's personality. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. You might call it attitude. Someone might call it attitude. Um, there's a work ethic. And then um, there's like some, there's like sort of an intuition about like how to hear something and then move towards that goal or just like mm -hmm. move, move towards the goal. I guess it's different than work ethic because it's, it's, it depends on prior learning, but it's some, I, you know, I think some kids just do like they, when they hear something or there, there's like a motivation to hear either to learn more or grow more or to chase after a sound that's in their head. I don't know how to describe that. I guess intuition is maybe the word I'm looking for. I just also believe that intuition is not something we're born with. It's something that has subconscious mm -hmm. learning behind it, but whatever. So these, these three things, I feel like um, it's, it's really easy to teach a kid if you have at least one of those three qualities and it's sure. much easier if you have two and you're really lucky if you have all three. Right. But as the, but as, as I teach more private lessons and I do, it's like, if I do a long day of band directing and then I come home and I private teach, it's like, you'd think the work ethic or something would be the most important quality, but it's nine out of 10 times. It's the personality <laughs> that makes the biggest difference. Yeah. Well, you know, I think some of this comes down to the, the, you know, pedagogy, of the oppressed, the Paulo Freire work about, you know, you know, kids aren't empty vessels, you know, they they come with pre existing knowledge and each one's a little bit different with what they come to the table with. And so basically we're just building into their knowledge. They're just taking what we give them and putting it in the context of what they already know. And some of them have had experiences that predispose them to be to move faster in music. And others don't. And I I think once we stop looking at them as blank slates and think about them as, you know, whole individuals who come with their own experiences and have their own things going on in their lives, then it's easier to, to sort of differentiate in a way that's meaningful for the kids. Yeah. Well, and I can challenge you as a teacher too, to like understand the, mm -hmm. their experiences better and, and to be more authentic with your own. Cause like at the end of the day, what I'm giving them is that's just, I'm also the same. I have only my experiences and yeah, they're they really, they really do appreciate hearing about things you do. And they, they, they respond when you share something that's powerful. Like if I tell them a story about a piece that made me cry once or made me want to be a music teacher and I play it for them, they listen a little bit more because they want to know what it was, what, what affected him. You know, it's no, it's more than just putting on Sousa when they walk in the door, you know, <laughs> you know, right. Yeah. I, this is one of those things that makes me feel like an anti-band director, but it's, it's for me, it's never the Sousa <laughs> when you walk in the door. <laughs> no, I know. My, I know. I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I totally feel you though. Yeah. There's but you know what I mean? That. It just, whatever the piece is that you have on. It's, I try to, you know, I try to vary it today. What was it today? Oh, well, we know we had to listen to the overcooked soundtrack today because we sight read the, <laughs> the student arrangement, but <laughs> usually, sure. I have a con an Apple music concert band playlist that I lazily sort of just was like, I need to figure out like, which, which I don't want to miss any, which should be in this. And I think I actually just like did a Wikipedia search for like concert. Yeah. Band before, and then I Apple music searched it all, but it's See, better than nothing. <laughs> I do random things because I teach really young kids. So like often the end of my fifth grade, I have fifth grade is like sectionals on Monday and then full class on Thursday. And at the end of that third class, it's 45 minutes. And all the beginning band teachers who teach kids that young know after about 35 minutes, they're kind of done. You know, it's, it gets you diminishing returns. So I often will have them pack up about 10 minutes early. And then as they're packing up, I'll put on these fun YouTube videos. And I think we did, 
I have a whole repertoire of these videos like saved up, you know, that I can call on. And so one of the kids, I don't know, you know, 11 year olds ask the craziest questions. Right. And so I have a trombone player who's always asking me questions. He's a cute kid. And he said, I like the trombone, but what instrument would I play if I didn't have arms? And I looked at him. And so I pulled up the video of the horn player in England who plays with his foot because he was born with no arms. Have you seen this video? I think I have, but I... And so, like, I just do these sorts of things. This is my, like, bell ringer at the end. There's always these crazy YouTube videos. You know, they really like the one where it's like the Hall of the Mountain King, and it's like the thing that's skating down the... Yeah. The the line racer. Things like this. this Uh, There's some synergy happening here. I need to maybe, like, at some point, figure out what some of your favorites are on this list, because I do a Friday video feature, which is essentially... uh I, I I just need to basically have I'm always trying to like make my list of YouTube links longer for mm-hmm. what I can pull. And it'll be anything from that to like the latest, you know, um Christopher Bill trombone cover to oh, yeah, 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 yeah. some yeah. short TikTok, you know, whatever. Yeah. Have you ever do you um listen ever listen to the Brass Junkies podcast? Yeah, it's I do. One of Andrew Hitz's shows. He had um Christopher Bill on. Did you listen to that episode? I did. I, Christopher Bill has been on this show. And, oh, um, really? Has he? That was, oh, that was terrific. Yeah. Andrew Hitz has oh, been on Andrew, this Andy was, yeah. Andrew was. I love that interview with, <laughs> that was one of right. my favorite episodes of that show. Yeah. Cause he's, you know, and what, um, what Hitz is, is, you know, he really like, I think he, um, has that attitude of like, he just knows how to like synthesize the conversation mm-hmm. and like take mm-hmm. something from it and then like present it in like such a, Cause he'll sometimes do those like after like do a podcast episode of like, just you know, here's my top level takeaways from another podcast episode I did recently. And yeah, he's really good at that. He's much better than I am. He's such a nice guy. He's actually the reason I started podcasting. Really? Um, I was, yeah, I started out the first music podcast I listened to was Garrett's hope, Garrett hopes composer podcast. Mm-hmm. And it was originally called, um, I can't remember the original name of it, but it's composer on fire now. And so I remember, listening to that show and listening to these composers tell their stories and going, wow, we're all really the same. We all have the same struggles. And I thought, wow, this is, and that was the format where I said, well, listen, if all these composers are having the same struggles, then I bet you band directors are having the same struggles too. And so then when I started to listen to Andrew's shows, I kind of began perfecting or not perfecting because I'm hardly perfect, but I began sort of imagining what a band director podcast would be so between garrett garrett hopes and and uh andrews those were the two that sort of inspired me and they're both they were both my first 10 episodes what i love about brass junkies is and this is just i mean this is so much largely just a personal preference and i get that people like varying things andrew even said this when he came on we talked about it a little bit but like some people would prefer things to be less conversational more focused some people like longer some people like shorter some people want like in their show you know it's like some people like the Mm -hmm. cursing some people don't i will always relate more to being a fly on the wall in a room of a bunch of musicians. So like if they Mm -hmm. get off topic and talk about what video game they're playing lately for like 30 minutes, I'm a, I'm bought in because I'm here yeah. for like the holistic, like, who are you? <laughs> and like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, all, yeah. it all connects like some, you know, whoever the brass player is on the episode might, I don't know. They might connect. So, yeah. No, I, you don't know what's going to inspire you from a podcast episode, episode and interview. And that's part of why I just try to like, let my guests talk as much as I can. Cause as you said, when we opened the, 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 this conversation is that you just don't know, you don't know what's going to come out. Yeah. You never do. And, and that's the, and sometimes the, the most unassuming guests I've had have had the most profound things to say. And sometimes the most famous biggest names have had not a whole lot that day. You know, maybe it's just cause we didn't connect or whatever, but you just never know. You just never know. Yeah, it's, it's a tough thing. I, I am, um, one of my, I don't know, one of the, one of the, maybe the positive strands in my life is just coming to, um, appreciate more and more the, the quiet workers in our field and the people who are yeah. uncelebrated and who just totally understand what they're doing <laughs> all the way through. I think there's, there's, there's so many. It's interesting that one of the things about my show is I, I, I feel really bad. So anyone who's listening to this, who listens to my show, if you've reached out to me with guest suggestions, I changed my email address about three years ago and I lost all those suggestions. So all these people were suggested. I had a list of them and then I lost it all anyway. But it's funny. I I kind of am 
I get a little tired sometimes of thinking of who to ask next, you know, and it's, it's what you just said is really important because I try to chase names that people know and it, you know, because people know them and they want to hear from them. But sometimes it just, I just want to call like my college buddy who's teaching over in Indianapolis and have him on the show. No one knows who he is. He's not done great things in the field, but he's got a really solid band program. He's taught at small schools and big schools and you know, I think you'd be a perfectly fine guest. I think that's a great idea. I mean, one of the reoccurring guests on this show is the orchestra teacher at my school, Ben Denny. He's one of the most influential music teachers in my life that I've learned a lot from. And we Mm -hmm. also have the distinct benefit of like knowing how to talk to each other. So (laughs) whenever he's on, it's like, we know what to, we know what to do. We don't have to, you know, like outline who's going to say what we just. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I I mean, I don't know about you, but I get these emails from crazy things like people who like, I just released my latest album, you know, so-and-so. And and I was wondering if I can get on your show. And I'm like, you have never listened to an episode of my show. You didn't read the byline. You have no idea what this is about. See ya. Because you didn't even take the time to find out. You just sent me a mass email. I get requests for people to like guest post on my blog about things that are really like like home remodeling. And I'm like, what blog post to do? Cause I do like my attitude is music education technology. It's not all, it's not music. And t- it's not like the combination of the three. It's all of them separately and in their various combinations. Like to me, it's the whole, I was like, if there's any, uh, this is just, and I titled it months and months and actually years after doing it casually, I had a rebrand maybe three or four years ago. And I was like, well, this is consistently the three topics I'm talking about. So I might as well mm-hmm. do it. But there's kind of a conception, I think, from some. It's like, oh, I'm going to talk about like teaching music technology, which is not necessarily the only thing. It is a sure. thing. Um, so I get, it's funny. I do get some of those emails that are like, like, I kind of see where you're coming from, but it's like, you don't, but like, if you're in the music industry and you want to be on, I don't know, it, do, it doesn't seem to strike the, the right tone. It's, it's, you know, you like right. obviously have never, listen to it or know like what kind of person because i would say like most people who come on the show are te- practicing teachers or software developers uh-huh or industry yeah yeah people yeah and that's who should be your target right at least that's what i think i honestly. think so i've done some solo episodes lately they're easier to make so <laughs> i've been experimenting uh-huh. a little bit with that it's like easy to just kind of and with Descript, i can just sort of improvise the topic with a light outline and then edit out the ums mm-hmm Sure. So that's, that's certainly a thing I'm I'm thinking about though, you know, one thing that is associated, I think with music technology, and that I think could potentially be inspiring to some who who listen is I'm trying to maybe branch out and get some, um, like video game and film composers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you've heard, listen to the, uh, composer on fire podcast, um, with Garrett hope, but he has had like Bear McCrary on and people like that. So one of his early episodes of Garrett's show, he had a composer on who started out his career playing cruise ship gigs. <laughs> but he, um, while he was on a cruise ship, he got like work to do orchestration for a TV show. And um, he really, it was interesting because, you know, I'm a very slow composer. I write just a couple pieces a year. I don't do it every day the way I should. And, and, you know, he was talking about how when you're writing for TV, you've got to write like 300 minutes of music a week just to get, you know, a 30 minute episode done. Some some crazy amount of music. And so he's saying, I don't understand how composers can write slowly. I just have to crank it out. And it was really interesting to like hear that very different perspective uh, on approaching music. Yeah. And that well, that's interesting. One of the things I'd love to ask someone who works in this aspect of film is like is to sort of understand what that job is or isn't. And I know that it's probably a little different for everyone, but I know that there are like lots of like someone who's writing the thematic content for one of these TV shows. Like I know that the whole entire sound design of the show, like the the composition is a very small piece of that pie. Uh, And it's interesting to think about the idea because sometimes these shows and, and like, you know, I mean this, this could open up a whole can of worms about like, do do we distinguish the idea of art or entertainment or or where where do we blur the lines and film a lot of these western uh, ideas that that we have about like what Mm. what music is but i mean i've heard like people in our space criticize a lot of film and tv show music and kind of saying it's you know derivative and Mm -hmm. i wonder to what first of all like there's a lot to unpack when i hear that but i wonder if the small truth that there is to that is the fact that like the composer is actually like at a certain point uninvolved <laughs> with what is actually making it into the show from an editing. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I guess, but 
you can equate it to what Bach was doing, you know, writing so much music every week just to get through a church service. Right. Um, you know, I think this notion and it's the romantic notion of great art and, you know, then it's championed, you know, throughout much of the 20th century about, you know, the importance of art and, you know, we teach music for art. I think, you know, we need to get back or, or kind of do more of the embracing of the praxial, you know, the, the David Elliott kind of idea where all music making has value. Um, it's the practice of making music and, you know, yes, there's, there's people who do it in different ways, but it's all valuable no matter what kind of music it is. Cause I mean, how else am I going to teach beginners, <laughs> you know, if it's not valuable? Right. I uh, know. I mean, so. I, totally, I totally get that. And I, and I think too, like, again, coming back to like everyone's sort of unique bundle of life experience and perspective. I mean, and, and, and to be honest, like you can take probably some you could probably take a handful of Marvel or Disney plus shows. And I could probably tell you that the music did not impact me in the same way that like, like a John Williams score for like yeah. the original trilogy did. But that's not to say that there is not like, I know that some of my students out there are listening, like watching Obi-Wan or some, or some show not to, being specific about one necessarily, but like, but something is just catching them. And sure. that might just be the beginning of their journey. But like that, something is, is just getting to them for the first time. And that's like an entry point, you know, that's just where they are in their musical journey. And I have to, you know, respect and appreciate that too. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I have a lot to, to I know you, that. I'm sure you do. Well, and I, it's funny, I think of it in association also with like this, I, I keep saying Disney plus, but it's like, there's a certain aspect of it too, where I try to, to me, this distinction I'm exploring is less about like, how do you approach your tastes musically on like how how do you assess the quality of the thing is not as important to me as it is like how do i define my own relationship with like the art because there is this aspect to like okay disney is going to keep making and i'm speaking now more broadly about the show not just the music on the show but like disney is gonna has ensured that probably we're going to be able to like sit in front of the tv every wednesday night and have marvel and and star wars content (laughs) injected into our veins for the rest of eternity (laughs) Like, what is that relationship? There's so much content. I, my wife and I have forgotten to watch the latest. What's this? The the Andor. Oh, we haven't we, started we watched, it yet. Cause... We watched the first three episodes, and it was like it was just getting good, and then we completely forgot about it right. because it's become so ubiquitous that we're just like it's not exciting anymore. <laughs> well, that's that's, a, so... but that's that's kind of what I'm saying though. Is it's like I feel like. Um, you know, it's almost like I feel like sometimes I'm just kind of plugging myself into the matrix when I watch a certain kind of when I engage with art in a certain kind of way. And I don't know if maybe that's more accurately how someone would define the, the line between being purely entertained. I don't know. I To me, it's it does open up this can of worms where it's like people can start to like say that there are like pieces of art that are like high art or um, that like are more challenging. And I don't, I don't want to. That's that's not where my head is at, but there is this aspect also where it's like, okay, yeah, I mean, what am I, what am I approaching, you know, the, the content, like, am I just like this sort of pure consumer who's just like, yeah, plug, you know, plugging in or is there, I don't know. You know, again, I, I will always fall back on, you know, I, I, I really love playing the planets. I really love playing the new world. Those were peak experiences for me, but I, I, get peak experiences listening to the rock and roll. I get peak experiences when my kids play popcorn prelude really well at a concert. You know what I mean? So I don't, I really, I really resist that great art um, thing. And you know, it's so funny. I embraced it for so long. And as a, as a theory teacher, because you kind of have to, when you teach the Western canon. Um, but over the years, I've just completely rejected it. So it's really hard for me to look at any music and say it doesn't have value of some kind. Because again, I go back to the idea that it's the making of the music. It's the music that exists all around us that has its value, not not what the music is. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I just keep banging on that point, I guess. But if everything, I filter everything through that philosophy. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I'm, that's that's the interesting thing to explore too. It's like because even when I start to utter the word "superior tone" to my band, I think to myself, "I'm like, whose definition of that are we doing here?" Well, okay, yeah, but there is. Yeah, yeah. But there are some characteristics. So, like we are, we have gathered here today yes. to do a, yes. a particular yes. kind of thing. Yes. Um, so, yes, and just because I say that all music is valuable, you know, the same thing comes to when we talked about the theory rules earlier. When you're gonna do something and you're gonna do something in a style, then do it to the best ability of that style. That doesn't mean it's more valuable. It just means you need to be superior in what you're doing all the time. <laughs> 
if that right. makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. You know. I, I'll give you this will this will maybe connect with uh, your theoretical background and come just coming back to general music. We're we're learning the major and the minor chord in our uh-huh. modern band book, and we're kind of in sound trap. And I'm explaining like, okay, we've got an A chord, minor chord and an A major chord, and I play both on the piano. And uh, I'm like, so what's like? Tell me what is the minor chord? Like, just what what is it? Um, without like really understanding like what's happening, like what is what does this one sound like? And you know they tip, you know they they've been conditioned. It's like, oh, that one's melancholy or sad or and that one's yeah. brighter. And I'm like, well, okay. And I play them a couple examples of like really upbeat happy minor music. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah I, I play yeah. them a couple of contrasting examples, and they're like, okay. And they're like, well, maybe we thought that the minor chord was minor or sad because you kind of like played it softer and like arpeggiated it in a certain way. Maybe you like, ah. like, ah, oh, now we're getting somewhere. Okay. So like, can we like explore this idea with it, no context? And the, the, the purest form of how we could describe the quality of the major and the minor chord was one of them is four semitones and then three and the other is the three and then four. Mm-hmm. So we got yeah. four, three and we got a three, four and that was it. I was like objectively, like we can't, we can't really understand this concept. Um, ec- divorced We've been conditioned other. to hear it in a certain way. Yeah. 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 Right. We've been conditioned. Um, it's, it's always interesting. I, I, when I started to hear them as one being feeling one feeling more compressed than the other, that's when I kind of got a breakthrough in my own ear training. I don't know if you do that with chords. I hear like expanded or compressed depending mm-hmm. on the chord. I yeah. know other people must, but that's how I hear them. And so when I hear that minor, everything feels more compressed. Yeah. I don't know. Well, and, um, I took a graduate conducting seminar, um, with, Michael Voda and Jim Ross at the University of Maryland a number of years ago. And they would have us, um, they would like play interval. So they, they had this like, oh gosh, I wish I could credit properly wit who it is who like had this system. I'd have to dig up the document, but basically like they would teach us how to identify in, um, intervals based on the number of semitones apart they were. Mm-hmm. And they sort of had a, almost like a system of sort of determining the resonance of those two intervals. So like we would like a second, was actually, um, they were, they kind of taught us to like hear the second as actually an extremely consonant and grounded, like a major second as a, as a pretty grounded sound. If you like really listen to how the two keys sort of mm-hmm. bounce off yeah, each other. It's, it's actually not as distant as it. Yeah. I, I agree. Right. If you short and, and, and then they, so they would call that one that was like rock. And then they had like different sort of like, um, ideas for each interval. And then we would try to identify them really fast. That was the idea was that you could identify them in and out of different context so like but we, <laughs> what was funny is they were out, very outside the box thinkers so like the three or four conducting graduate students we were just like kind of pacing around the room and then like one of them would like play them on the piano we would just try to like say this number of semitones apart they were as fast as we could by identifying their mm-hmm. quality so to speak it's interesting i you know i just memorize them over time of course so i know them all right. but i had a um a composition teacher during my master's degree and he he was he wrote very uh challenging music let's put it that way um, but his whole thing was, you know, cat classify the, the intervals by their dissonance from most consonant to most dissonant. And so, you know, the minor ninth is the most dissonant, you know, because of the way it's, you know, that octave plus, you know, and sort of there's like all these different, like it's, you know, more dissonant than a minor second even. And so we had all, we had all these categories, categorizations and his whole idea was that the music should pulse between dissonance and consonance regardless of the chord structure regard you know that's what major that's what tonal music is why can't it work with atonal music or non centrist tonal you know music and um i hated it but it was interesting theory anyway <laughs> yeah I, I i yeah it's interesting yeah i do think that a lot of music does you know explore uh well i mean the the, and, the whole and, basis of music is you know if we boil down form, it's about starting in a home and going away and coming back home. And that's what keys do. And that's what scales do, you know, going up to so and a scale. And then, you know, we're either going back up to dough or we're coming back down to dough. You know, it's, we went somewhere and we're coming back. Right. Yeah. I think we're definitely, um, there is, you know, a lot of music does explore this feeling of like coming away from something and sort of returning our attention mm-hmm. and our resolution, but how it explores that is not strictly yeah. harmonic as many of us have been trained to think that. Yeah. It- yeah, yeah. No, there's rhythm, dis- rhythmic dissonance and harmonic dissonance and ostinatos can create, you know, a feeling of comfort, even if they're dissonant, you know, because they're familiar. It's yeah, it's, there's all kinds of ways it can be expressed. I'm just being the most basic <laughs> I can be. Totally. Totally. Yeah. No, it's, it's really fascinating. I, I, 
one thing I do, you know, I, I was a comp- composition, but I took a lot of theory classes to get a doctorate in composition. And, um, you know, I'd go to the theory conference every year, you know, that would, that was, it was always fun to go to those sessions where I kind of barely understood everything. I mean, I did, but I didn't kind of thing. You know what I mean? Cause I'm not, and I think that's true of everyone, unless you're really steeped in that particular topic, there's always going to be things that are specific to that particular. And it was always interesting to, to hear the different ideas of how music works and, the different um, readings of different music and, you know, the things you could pick up. And I still, to be honest, I still use some of those things as a composer and as a band director. I mean, one of the best I ever saw was this thing on hypermeter and it was just talking about like how in the music of, and who was it? It was, um, I think it was Clara Schumann actually, how she, she had this odd, way of using hypermeter where it would feel like it's in groups of, of four or eight. And then every now and then it would be like a group of seven or a group of five that was off. And it had a way of like making the, even though the phrases might still be eight bars, the hypermeter got off somehow. And it sort of became a hemiola within the, the larger metric scheme of the piece. It's, it's really cool actually when you get into it. Yeah, that is very cool. Yeah. It's just so much to know and learn. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I've made it my life's mission to get as much useless information as I can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Relatable. I did want to say that that, that website that I mentioned earlier that I couldn't remember is called hooktheory.com. Really cool. Yeah. It's anyway. auto completed. So I've been here sometime <laughs> in the past. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. I, I, I kind of want to get a subscription, but. I haven't pulled the trigger yet. Okay, cool. I'll leave this bookmarked. I'll link that in the notes to the episode. I love to do bit, like lots of show notes. That's my... Uh-huh. Oh, I, I gave up on that after a while. It just became another thing I hated to do. So if you're listening to this, I'll just say, like, I actually spent <laughs> a lot of time linking everything that we talked about into the notes. So definitely go into your podcast, App of Choice, <laughs> and sway whatever it is. You got to find out how to read the notes. There's linkable, little tappable things. You can go to hooktheory.com right from your, but unless you're driving, don't go to, don't tap it if you're driving. <laughs> I also do chapters. Um, just, just putting it out there for you listeners. Like if there was a part of this conversation and you were like, I don't want to hear about music theory anymore, you can tap the next <laughs> chapter and skip. No, you need to listen to me pontificate on hypermeter. <laughs> You can skip the ads too if you want. And lately, my I've sponsored myself a lot lately with my scale exercise play along tracks available on rubbyburns dot com slash store. And <laughs> you can skip those too if you want to, or subscribe on Patreon to the bonus. I didn't expect to actually. I wasn't planning to insert this here, but you know uh, there are options for you if you're listening. You know you can you can um, become a, a podcast power user. Actually, what what podcast app is your podcast app of choice as a an experienced listener and producer oh the one i use to listen yeah what do you listen um, to? Then? oh my goodness i think it's pocket cast I, it's been a while since oh yeah pocket casts it's gone through many different iterations but it's kind of worked for me and i know how to use it so that's what yeah, i use that's good yeah i, I describe pocket cast they're like the one who of all the cool ones that are out there they're they try to like be available everywhere and they try to have the most features that seem to be like the cool ones that all the other mm-hmm. apps do they try to have yeah, a lot to do. So they're they're pretty good. Um, I use Overcast. Hands down, the feature in Pocket Cast that I use the most are the filters, where I can I can filter by downloaded, partially listened to, uh, okay. not downloaded, and so I have these playlists where I like I have all the ones that I'm subscribed to, and I get all the new episodes, and then I can filter that by what I wanted to load by topic or whatever, and so then I can download what I want, and then I have my downloaded filter, and that that's where I actually like, you know. That's where I, you know, click in the car where I go to find, you know, what I'm going to listen to next. That's I good. Always have the Everything Band podcast at the top of that since we're self promoting. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, I, I don't listen to my I, own podcast. I listen to it twice <laughs> when I edit. So yeah, 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 yeah. No, totally. I um. So you're th- oh, you're third in my line here. Your episode two hundred five is third in line here. It just released today. Just released today. Yeah, I um, I do a little bit of light playlisting. Um, I use Overcast and. Uh, it, so it has this thing called, like, it has these really good audio features. I think the developer of it, who I follow on, online, has done, like, a lot of technical backend to make it sound really good. So, like, if you're like me, which maybe you're not an insane person who listens to podcasts much faster than their 
produced. Um, I, I listen like 1.2, 1. 1.3. 1. Okay. I got sometimes go up to two and I, <laughs> Oof. but he, uh, my wife gives me a hard time when she's in the car. She's like starts making little chipmunk sounds at me <laughs> when I, <laughs> but the pitch doesn't raise in their voices when you go to X. It's just that's the speed, you know, she just starts like making yeah, yeah, fun. Yeah. Um, but something well, he's it, done, it gets to be like this and then you hear it in like little burps and <laughs> exactly, like, exactly. <laughs> drives me crazy. Yeah, I, I, I do it. And, and he's something about the way he's got the audio engine worked is it's like the best, it's got the best, you know, 1.25 too. Like it sounds the most mm-hmm. natural. He's also got something on smart, smart speed, which like shortens the silences. Oh yeah. That's subtly. a nice feature. That's a nice feature. I, you know, when I use Adobe edition, it's got a feature where it analyzes the silences and it'll cut them down. So if I have someone who has a lot of pauses, um, I can run it through audition and there's a, there's a, you know, a, a tool, whatever we call that, a plugin or whatever that does that. And so I can like take out, I can shorten them to like 30% of what they were. And so it does them all individually by, you know, how long they were. So it sounds natural. Cause you know, as well as I do, you, when, when someone who's never been on a podcast starts talking and they get into that first couple of minutes, they often are thinking about, every word (laughs) you know i mean it's and you hear them like warm up as they go through it's funny it's yeah that's pretty interesting yeah and well so i mean i do try to edit as much as that as i can but like smart speed and overcast does it so it really subtly like little little tiny clips you know Mm -hmm. and uh, and i'll just tell you i'm looking there's a page in the settings that says smart speed has saved you an extra 242 hours beyond speed adjustments alone so not including the fact that i listen at 2x just the smart wow. speed feature itself has apparently saved me 242. So, I mean, if you're, I know, you know, people listen to podcasts for different reasons, but if you're a busy teacher with a short commute and you're listening to the Everything Band podcast to get some development, you want to, you know, I'm just saying this, if you're, if you're listening to podcasts to learn, that's more learning for you in your car. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's funny though. Sometimes, you know, I know exactly how long my commute is. So sometimes if I have an episode and I've got it on like 1.2, it throws off my timing. And so then I've got like five minutes into the second podcast rather than having my whole commute in one. People tell me this, <laughs> that, that I've, I've received feedback that my show's, um, inconsistent length is sometimes like I've been some, cause sometimes yeah. they're long. Like I'm not probably going to cut that. We've been talking a while. I'm not going to, you know, cut a lot, but I'll, you know, I'll do some editing, but it's like, um, and I only do two a month at most. So it's, you know, I mean, I, I kind of, to me, my, my thing is I, I, it's like, I'm, I'm either like, I've got enough of them to listen to that. I'm, if one finishes, then I just start yeah. to the next. Yeah. And the long form has a place. I, I, Andrew Hitz has actually talked about this where, you know, the, the studies show that the 25 minute podcast is the sweet spot for most people, but I can't, I, people, I mean, I, I'm going to have, you know, John Mackey on once and that's it. So if he wants to talk for an hour and a half as he did, then I'm going to give you all hour and all 90 minutes of that. I'm not going to cut that. Right. No, so, I totally agree. I totally agree. I, uh, you know, and, and that's just the style of my show. If you don't like it, you know, I'm not going to say tough, but tough. <laughs> it's just, it's the way I feel. I feel like I'm creating, um, an archival record of the people who are, are making things happen in the band world right now. And I don't want to cut that. Now you do a fair amount of, um, I would, I don't know what category of like, I don't know how to classify this kind of thing, but I mean, you know, you do have a pretty regular, you have a pretty consistent format, pretty regular publishing schedule. You do, you know, a noticeable well, until the last couple of years. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. Right. I'm but sorry. I mean, like, no, totally. But I mean like a, 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 you know, you, um, I'd say like, you know, you are putting like, there's like some social media activity happening. You're putting it out there. You have some sponsorships. Like what? Um, how? What? To what? Ask the degree. I guess. Do would you say like some of those efforts are? Because like at the end of the day, like you have to love doing this and do it for you if you're going to be able to do it at the end of a long work day. Yeah. So like, to yeah. what extent do you feel like you do some of those, like kind of podcasting logistics, um, for the benefit of the show having wider reach versus like your own? Or is that just sort of naturally how you come at the show? Well, I think early on, it was really important for me to expand my audience. And, you know, even up until about episode 150, I was very concerned about the weekly numbers. Like, oh, look at the growth. Look at how many more people listen this week. And I guess in the last 60 episodes, I just don't necessarily care anymore. And I don't want to sound flippant about that. 
but it, uh, the pandemic has really kind of given me perspective about just where the important things are. And I do the podcast and I've always done the podcast because I really like to talk about band because I really thought I had something to offer the community because I remember being a band director back in the nineties when there was only one other person I can talk to and I had to figure out everything out on my own. And if I had just some resource where I could listen to other people talk about their challenges, it would have helped me. And at the end of the day, there's a little part of my ego that wants me to do it too. And so the listener matters to me. I'm just, but I really don't think about the listeners when I do my show because I don't, I have social anxiety. You know, it's so funny. I have stage fright, but I love being on stage. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. But I don't, you know, I, I separate myself from the audience and I always have, you know, whether I'm on the podium or whether I've got my trumpet in my hand or whether I'm giving a speech at Midwest or where, you know, whatever it is I'm doing. Um, I just don't think about the audience. I just, tune it out. And it's the same thing with the podcast, which is why when I get the numerous emails and I'm so appreciative of them because it reminds me that I am having some impact on people. When I get that email that says, I love your show. Thanks for what you're doing. Or can you look at this person as a guest? I, I just love that so much because it's like validation that I wasn't seeking. So it feels more authentic because I don't look for that. I do this show completely because I want to. Yeah, that's, that's pretty encouraging and good to hear because that's, how I am trying to, I sort of, so the pandemic actually, it's interesting. Maybe we had a, like a reverse perspective, like the pandemic gave me more free time in my, mm -hmm. in my pajamas. And I was like, well, I'm sitting in front of a computer. Mm -hmm. I think I can probably pump out more consistent content. And certainly there was a hunger for, especially like the more technological, you know, themes mm -hmm. and topics I discussed. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. More consistency. So like, I think definitely I was putting out more and then last school year when we returned i was like i cannot do two a, mo a month every month especially because they're yeah. long you know so um so this year i'm like trying to kind of revisit i'm like wait what do, what do i want to do who are the people that i want to talk to what's yeah. the pace that i want to yeah. publish and the topics so that's that's encouraging to hear because you know yeah it, you know again it's the it's been a tough i'm gonna say 18 months for me and i i'm pretty upfront about this for anyone who asks the podcast, I stopped doing regular podcasts, even though I've got the two, uh, Jake and Colin, who helped me. Um, I just have been struggling with anxiety and depression in the last 18 months, and it's been pretty bad. And my motivation is low to do extra things. I've cut back on my composing. I've cut back on the podcast, all these things. I'm just trying to kind of gear those things back up as I sort of come out of it. But I don't know. I just reacted badly at the end of the pandemic and not teaching band for a couple of years when... You know, I changed my whole career. I gave up my dreams as a college professor to be a band director again, and then band goes away. It 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 wasn't great for my mental health. So, you know, I'm hoping to get back in track, but, you know, that's part of why the numbers don't matter much to me anymore, because I'm so focused on just myself and being yeah. right. So, yeah, I, I feel similarly. I've sort of like, so that was like my pandemic approach. And now I feel like I'm kind of like maybe back to that attitude yeah. which is like this is it's a busy job so like this is the this is just like an extra yeah. fun thing yeah I'm, I'm kind of also right now my daughter just started travel softball and i i just kind of and my son wants to do uh rec league basketball and actually my first gig <laughs> my first gig i taught high school band junior high band and i coached basketball oh awesome That's <laughs> that cool. was my first gig and so i'm thinking about coaching his rec league team i'm just kind of enjoying not worrying about trying to publish a piece of music and instead focusing on my kids who are 10 and 11. And this is sort of prime time for them, you know? Yeah. You know, so I want to be dad a little bit more too. You know, I have a lot. So my son is two and a half and I would, you know, I would be curious, maybe this is something for maybe down the road. I'll have to pick your brain about this. Um, I, I just didn't grow up with a lot of exposure to how anything athletic works, but I have, I'm convinced like in my in my adult life, I've become much more physically active, and I'm convinced mm -hmm. that there's got to be a way to teach team sports with the kind of attitude about learning that I have now that I didn't have when I was 10, 11 years old. And yeah. you know, I just felt like I couldn't do anything because that's how kids talk to each other. And frankly, that's how coaches sort of they they encourage that, you know, or don't, they, they don't they it's like they don't not discourage it. I don't know if that was too many double negatives, but you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and we, you know, we, we, of course we call it growth mindset, but I, I'd be extremely curious to know what a music teacher with your experience, how, like how you would approach 
11 year old basketball practice as a coach. Well, it's interesting. I was thinking about it the other day because this is going to be a rec league team. My son has shown no inclination to team sports until now. Like none. He likes to run. He does a running club at school, so he might do track. But he's, this is the first time he's ever thought about a team sport because he's really not competitive to the point like where he and I play a video game. He like doesn't like that I want to win. <laughs> That's how uncompetitive he is. And so I was thinking about it a lot, like, boy, I'm going to have to teach a lot of skills. And I just am approaching it like a band director. Okay, so first things first is we've got to talk about, like, the rules. Like, what happens when the ball goes out of bounds? What happens when there's a rebound or a made basket? You know, the basic things. Then we go to dribbling. You know what I mean? It's like you have to set the tableau for the kids in a way where, like, we're starting from the very beginning. And so I'm just going to teach it skills based, just like I teach band. And, you know, we're not going to worry about the big things. You know, I'll, I'll come up with some kind of like offense that like 10 year olds can do, you know? Sure. <laughs> but it's can't be anything, you know, it's certainly not going to be the offense that I taught, you know, when I was, or when I played high school basketball, you know, but there's double the, screens and, sure. you know, yeah. different variations off of like situations. It's not going to be any of that. But there's the parallels are so clear to me because it's like what you're describing yeah. the skill based thing, you know, um, what, what I, how I try to, you know, as you said earlier, like break down music into its smallest parts is, you know, I try yeah, to yeah. have that, that degree of like mental focus and like, you know, physical and mental effort that's just like happening on repeating some like really, really small idea a lot. And I, and that's mm-hmm. one way to approach music. And then there's that other aspect that I said earlier, which is like, there's a benefit to just playing a band 50 minutes a day in middle school. Like there's a yeah, benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Where you can't, I can't really control what the kid is focusing on. They're just like blowing on their instrument. Like there's something to that too. And I feel like as me growing up as a kid, I didn't have anyone in my life who, when I was out of practice was willing to just throw the ball, the baseball back and forth for hours and hours and hours. Um, and I also didn't have any, like, I just wasn't playing casually a lot. So I had neither of those kinds of attitudes mm-hmm. towards skill development or, or I guess environments really are, you know, so I just, you know, every time I couldn't catch a ball, I was like, I can't catch a ball. Um, yeah. Rather than something you want to work on. Right. I think sports in a, in a funny way, sports are even harder to get kids to get into that growth mindset than band because for most of the kids when they start band in fourth grade that's the first time you're ever giving them an instrument or sixth grade wherever you are whatever grade it is but you know kids do like basketball and PE when they're second graders and they all are measuring themselves against others you know I think about my experience as a kid I had older brothers and sisters, so I had people to play catch with, but this was pre-internet days. This was the, the late seventies, early eighties. I, I spent vast portions of my childhood bouncing a ball against the wall or throwing rocks at a can or doing things like this, but I wasn't interested in team sports. It wasn't until sixth grade wiffle ball where I realized, wow, I can really hit this ball hard, <laughs> you know, where it was just kind of like it, it changed for me. And I think, you know, I just heard this, um, and again, I think it's my last podcast guest, John Wojciechowski, who said this on the episode. I've, I've really been thinking about it the last 24 hours or so, is, you know, that philosophy of when the student's ready, the teacher will come. In some ways, that was my athletic career, too. One day, I just realized that, gee, maybe I can do this kind of thing, you know? Whereas with band, everyone starts, well, most everyone starts from square one. Yeah, no, but it makes it makes so much sense. Yeah, not having... And again, it's completely anecdotal, but... There's nothing backing up anything I just said. <laughs> sure. Well, li- living and breathing on anecdotal evidence quite a lot. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious to, yeah, I, to explore that because part of me wants to, wants to, co- if that's what he chooses to do. I mean, we're also like totally happy if he wants to do like rock climbing and martial arts and yeah. swimming and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 My philosophy is always exactly that. You know, the idea when the student's ready, the teacher will come when they want me to help them with music they'll come to me. I'm not going to force it on them. And so that's kind of my whole philosophy about everything with their lives. And maybe, maybe I'm not going to have the super kid, but I I don't know. That's how I know how to parent, which is just individual, right? I don't know. Maybe I'm just, again, I pitificate again. I'm all got all kinds of soapboxes littered across this interview. Uh, (laughs) Totally. Well, and that, I mean, that's, you know, this is why I invited you is to do something. Yeah. Listen to Mark, on his polemics all 
<laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, this is a great perspective. You know, like I said, you're voy- you're the only uh, you're like, you know, asking lots of questions in yeah. hearing your voice. So yeah, it's so funny. Dylan, <laughs> Dylan Maddox and who does with Kate Nishimura, they do the Bandroom podcast, which is an interview format. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, at, at Midwest last year, he was like, "You're the you're the Godfather of interview podcasts," and I was like, "The Godfather." <laughs> Here I am in my basement, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's that's where I am. It's funny. I just it makes me it makes me laugh. I'm not professional at this at all. I just I just been persistent. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's that's kind of how I feel. One of my favorite on, ongoing inner dialogues and uh, things that I think about, but that no one ever wants to talk about or, or break apart with me is like how inconsistent, like how versatile email is and how inconsistently I use it. <laughs> I like, mm-hmm. like every possible attitude about how you could have an email communication. Um, I, I do it all interchangeably for the benefit of having no email <laughs> anymore yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, one, I, 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 I'm very inbox zero oriented to, um, I I just don't like email in a lot of ways. The anxiety I've been feeling in the last year and a half, email and Facebook like exacerbate it more than any other mediums. When I see an email come in and, the, and if it has a title that makes me like anxious, it can trigger me in ways that, and I don't, I took Facebook off my phone because if I surf in the morning, it ruins my day. So I did. I, and now I'm going to get on my soapbox. Um, and I just have to tell you that I have changed my relationship. This is another, it was more of a post COVID thing than it was a COVID thing. Cause I was definitely very online um, because I was sharing, like doing more sharing of the show and things, yeah, and sharing yeah. resources and stuff on Facebook. Cause Facebook is where the people are. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I still check once a day, but I just can't do it in the morning. Yeah. And I, I'll kind of like scroll through the feed a little bit once every day or two, but I deleted all Facebook brand or meta. I deleted all their apps off my phone because the thing is that in addition to some of the anxieties that come with it and some of my distaste for the company philosophy is also the fact that like the products are genuinely becoming worse at doing what I want them to do. Like the benefit of Facebook is that I actually do know most most of the people who I'm, you know, like if it's no longer showing me anything other than ads and I'm not seeing my friend's new kid, um, then I actually find it to be less useful to me. So I've, I've done quite a bit. Like I'm like really using, I'm using a Twitter app that shows me no ads, just the tweets of the people I follow and the order mm-hmm. I follow them heavily muted, uh, sp- especially politics. And then I'm in, really into discord and Reddit lately. And I subscribe only to very specific communities of like-minded mm-hmm. people who, which to, I've been so- using, I've been using Reddit more lately. Um, my kids are in a discord, which people who are listening are like, they're 10 and 11. They shouldn't be, but this is the world right now. So anyway, that's a whole nother conversation, right? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what though. Like so a lot of these, one of the major problems is the moderation of some of these big tech social platforms. And the thing is, is like the, I'm on a couple, um, I support a few technology podcast networks and they have discords associated with them that are heavily moderated. If you're like, sometimes mm-hmm. it comes across yeah. a little too strong. Like if someone says something that's interpreted as mean and it's not like, they'll kind of get, you know, ticketed. I, my, I do. I do. That's one of the reasons why I allow them to use Discord is because it is heavily moderated as opposed to like instant messenger, which can be anything, you know? Exactly. And I, I'm kind of glad for it. These are small communities because to me, the power of the internet is the fact that I can, there's sort of two layers to it. There's like the, first of all, the aspect of like, I can, the people who are interested in exactly the things that I like, I can have like a reach to all of those people wherever and they don't have to be in my local community and then there's the secondary aspect which builds on that which is like i can have multiple aspects of myself which i can similarly whether it's through different social media apps or communities within an app i can have like sort of different channels or contexts that explore different parts of myself whereas where i'm existing in like real physical space i feel like i'm sort of like you know in a sense almost moderating myself because i'm trying to be whatever is appropriate to my environment where it's like you can kind of like when you're on Reddit and you're just subscribed only to like, you know, for me, it's like Apple computers, classic cocktails, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, other like <laughs> all just like a very specific list of. Yeah, I'm like subscribed to like the Beagle <laughs> channel, right. and like, you know, gardening and, you know, things that are like I don't I won't subscribe to the music ones because they drive me crazy because. I, I once had a trumpet teacher who who said, you know, people always you tell me you're a musician, they always want to talk to you, but what they don't understand is that music is not my hobby. Fishing is my hobby. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, 
it's 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 hard. Those communities are hard because of that. There's there's more hobbyists than there are, you know. I like that though. I like there's a thing. So a very specific. Just it's like probably is the most specific thing I do that it's like I don't know anyone in my life who I've talked to face to face who would do this. But like I use some home automation tech, and a few of the home the things that we have don't show up like in the Apple. Apple has like a home app on the phone that all of your lights or whatever show up in. And like we have a couple of things that don't show up in there because they're not designed to work that way. Well, I installed a I like set up a server that tricks. <laughs> it's it's like a server that you you download some code and you run it permanently on a computer and then you can like basically code some little, you know, like I could get my Nest thermostat to show up wow. in the Apple Home app and it's you like have these this whole plugin architecture. Like no one in my life will do that, but there are thousands of people in the Reddit <laughs> Sub community for that yes. thing. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I'm like, can you please yes. tell me? Cause I don't know how to code. I'm like, can you please tell me which line of code is making my nest thermostat like tell me the wrong temperature? And it's like, oh yeah, you uh, forgot a comma in line four. <laughs> I'm like, thank yeah, you. Yeah. 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 No, it's true. Reddit is amazing for that, that aspect. You know, if there was like a specific one, like analyzing Wagner, you know, or the Tristan and Isolde <laughs> or subreddit, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or the hypermeter subreddit. Maybe that's yeah. the one I should create. <laughs> Probably is one. There's, well, there's a subreddit for everything. It seems like it, but maybe I just am not Reddit skilled enough. Yeah, I just sort of like, yeah, I got, I don't know. It's a slow, it's a slow burn. I just sort of find things slowly over yeah. time. And... Yeah, yeah. It's so funny. Keith Kelly, who's, you know, he works for Horizon now. He's like, had, he's my sponsor basically. And, um, you know, he and I sat, he has a podcast now, um, the global band director. Okay. And so we sat at Midwest and we were talking about our kids and we were joking that we need to have a dad podcast with Keith and Mark where we're talking about like raising kids as if we have any advice to offer anyone. <laughs> They're still breathing. <laughs> That's <yeah>. success. <laughs> I think that'd be fun. I think if you're, you know, this is my thing is if I had more free time, um, I would have, cause this podcast started as a for fun one where the topics were more variable. I'll mm. actually say, I always like to sneak this in. One of my favorite recordings ever is with a good friend of mine named Alan Georgia. And we talked actually about like algorithmic, um, media curation. And we kind of talked mm. about like Twitter and music, cur- you know, it was around the time that like Spotify and Apple music were kind of like rising with these, like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and it's like, is the thing deciding what you like based on your habits and then feeding it to you. Or is like the thing human curated and kind of that different, you know, we, I, li- I really liked that conversation, even though it's very before I knew what I was doing with the show. We also talked about pickling on episode, but I, I, things were more mm-hmm. variable then. And I, to me, it's like now that I'm more focused on the topics, I feel like I need a B podcast where I just. Speaking of algorithms, you know, I, my iPhone, I have Beats uh, earbuds. Huh. And so when I put the Beats Pro earbuds in, it auto plays music from my Apple list. Uh-huh. My, like Apple music list, but it's completely random. So I might get like Ella Fitzgerald and then I might get like queen and then I might get like the Beatles and then I might get like some, you know, you know, jazz, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, but it's always random. And I, Apple does not let you turn that darn auto play off. There was, there was, this is a thing is like this. I believe that this is related to, cause there used to be, there's some old, it's funny how, how, how old um, car stereo systems how like how old the technology is because mm-hmm. that, that does still happen when um like lately like apple like the iphone has this thing where it's like it, it, it sort of remembers in the back like audio apps have more access to background activity so like it'll kind of remember if i was listening to a podcast on the way to work when i get in it'll start playing that same episode for mine me. never does but if somehow oh, mine did it's mm, interesting yeah uh, do you close all your apps when you're done with them or you just let them i generally close them all i'm okay. pretty nutty about that yeah, that's probably why. So like you, so the iPhone is like designed to sort of manage that in the background uh-huh. for you. So like, I think th- what is happening is the overcast is like, it, it's not like just running all day, but it is um, able to like communicate. Hey, I was the last thing, but if it isn't able to communicate it, then my car will do this thing you're talking about. And somebody years ago made a track that was like selling like crazy on the iTunes store because all it was was um because because typically what the cars will do is this is from like the i the early ipod era is they'll play they'll default to like the alphabetical first thing and uh someone was selling a track that was making like millions of dollars on itunes that was basically just a song with whatever is the first computer keyboard 
in the you know like the computer alphabet i don't know the technical word for that but basically the thing that a computer registers the character that it registers as like before <laughs> even uh-huh. the letter a it was just a string of those like 20 of them in a row and then the track was just silence <laughs> for like 20 uh-huh. minutes yeah. uh, so that you don't get because my my first track alphabetically is the track um off of the first track off of a record from a band that i was kicked out of in uh, a college, <laughs> it left me very bitter that my car, <laughs> every time I would sit in it, <laughs> would, would play that same song. Yeah, yeah. I do actually, I do typically do a music listening, a recent app, and a recent tech tip of the week. We don't have to go long, but if you have, like, is there anything, like, recently that you've been listening to that you would recommend Listeners as far as account. as far as what as a, an app or I used to I used to do it like an album but then like some people have mentioned pay- playlists or recent concerts they went to oh oh like what I'm listening to right now yeah oh man you know I I played I was I did that gig with the St Louis Symphony so I was really listening to that stuff but um I, you know I haven't really just put on music in a while I mean it was sort of like the whole Jupiter and the Dvorak and you know Mambo from West Side Story because that's what I was playing and I need to learn those those you know that music. So I I I, I honestly can't remember the last thing I just put on to listen to. That's sad. I'm a musician. That's think, really sad. I think that counts though. I count that. That's just a that's just the where you're coming from. You know. Yeah, I think it, it makes me. Oh, you know, I have been listening to this local radio station here in St. Louis that does a really nice mix of like '80s music and modern music. And so um, I have been, you know, jamming out to some 80s music. It was a really nice night the other night. And I went to high school in Salinas, California. And the temperature there is always around like 65 degrees and cloudy. Oh, we used yeah. to call it Mordor. We used to call it Mordor. But, you know, as an adult, it's like perfect. Right. right? And so it was like that temperature and like Paula Abdul came on and she was like really popular when I was a senior in high school. And I just remember like I rolled down the window. It was like I was back in my Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme jamming out to Paula Abdul. I love that. I'm counting that as your pick. Paul, <laughs> <laughs> Paul Abdul. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the song, but it's one of her few hits, so can't be many. Straight up now. That sounds Straight right. Straight up now. Tell me, do you really yeah, yeah, want to yeah. know? <laughs> so I, I, you know, I don't know if you ever, it's like, uh, listen, have an artist you listen to a lot. And then, you know, I, this, I find this like with a, especially um just like artists who have recorded just a ton um and it's like you you think you've listened to all their music and then you just discover an album and you're like why have i never listened to this album before mm. um that's how i feel about we get requests by the oscar peterson trio i've been listening to it mm-hmm. last week and i'm like i mean part of it is like you know there's so much great jazz out there that i just feel like you know some of it is like personally yeah. tailored to like what you but also, like some of these musicians put as all of the, all of their recordings are so great of that like that same mm-hmm. characteristic that it's like, well, you know, if you well, and to- then it's like you can have a performance of the same song that's on a different album, but it's so different because you know jazz is so in the moment, and every every performance is different. It's very impenetrable because of that to me. Whereas you know, I know every Queen album, I know every Beatles album. I, you know, I, these are the yes, you know, the the bands I really love, and you know, to to, but when you get into jazz, you just like artists. You know, I really like Oscar Peterson. I really like you know the Art Blakey stuff. I really like the Horace Silver stuff. You know, that post bop or cool era. Yeah, you know, that's kind of my wheelhouse, and I know those artists really well, and of course, you know, all the other greats that, that I know, but I don't know every exhaustive recording by them right that's well that's how i feel and that's why i'm so delighted that i found this record because like i'll tell you track one let me figure out uh quiet nights of quiet stars um telling you this drummer is just like holding down a groove with brushes like playing in an Mm -hmm. It doesn't deviate from it for the whole track and uh, that's not i don't know that's probably something i've heard before but i was just like this is holding the whole tune together and he's just doing like the easiest thing so I always ask my listeners what their favorite piece is. What's your go-to jazz album? Like, what would be the one that, if you had to listen to one, like, it would be your first one? For, well, uh, is this a scenario where I only get one, or is it just like... Yeah, 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 no, no you only get one. Like, this is my rules now. Because I, I can never answer, as you, I'm sure, can imagine. This is not the kind of question that somebody likes to be asked who has... No, they hate it every time. Range. But, I, but I'm going to just, like, say the first thing that comes <laughs> to my mind, because there's probably a lot of things that could easily fit. But I'll just say, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me try to like sit with this for a couple of seconds and then just say the very first thing. I mean, okay. I, I 
one one of many possible answers to this, but absolutely a true one that I could say is um, the uh, Max Roach and Clifford Brown record. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, that's a good one. Mine, mine's Blues and the Abstract Truth. Yeah. I, you know, it's just I don't know why. It's just the first one where maybe I had my own opinion about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Instead of everyone saying, oh, you got to listen to Kind of Blue, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Whereas I remember I remember getting that one and going, yeah, I really like, you know, it was like on my own terms kind of thing. Is that? I love that. Know? Yeah, that's important. I mean, I, you know, I've had, for me, like a lot of that was more in the fusion space. There's probably a lot of things that are like more in the, in the seventies and the eighties that maybe I mm-hmm. could take with me. And there's a lot of modern stuff that I, you know, that I'm listening to. I mean, there's a lot of things that like, did you read this piece? There's this, inter- I, I feel like it's NPR. I'll link it. It's, um, it's this piece about like how viral jazz, uh, what is the title of it? Like what, it, what is viral jazz or like viral jazz is the new thing. It's, it's this whole piece on like how, um, like short form, I guess more like internet platform, media platforms are sort of like birthing a genre of jazz. Like basically like musicians who are like steeped in all these like jazz traditions and who are by no means sure. running away from, um, all of the like very serious work ethic that it takes to like, work through those chops, but that are really embracing everything from like YouTube to Instagram to like really short form media to get their music out there. Um, but how that the collaborations between these musicians and the kinds of short form media and the collab- and also like kind of conversation that they're having with their fans has sort of like, there's sort of a sound that's developing around this and like sort of what are the characteristics? So actually I could have easily picked well, my- it's really interesting you say that because, you know, TikTok videos are like, that's like the biggest thing right now. But, you know, our, what we do as band directors doesn't fit the TikTok thing. I mean, I'm wondering if there's ways you can have like little viral band clips you know, <laughs> that might help what we do. There's a lot of band directors who are doing stuff on TikTok, but it's interesting because it always feels like. Well, I, um, I would really worry about the student images and, you know, I don't like to put students on social media. In oh, I mean, I mean, context. not, well, they're not necessarily like showing their class um are necessarily oh, right you know people i mean there's people doing funny things like little skits about like you know where they're imitating yeah. their students the funny things their students say or do but there's yeah, 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 a lot yeah. of conduct i follow a couple of people who are like conducting graduate students or professors yeah, yeah. who like you know conducting videos of themselves or a lot of musicians um mm-hmm. record and, and there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there uh, yeah, it's, I'm interested. I am interested in how the short form, because one of the characteristics that sort of unites all these people who are in the article classified as viral jazz musicians, um, is, is they're all a little bit like they all embrace hip hop and especially pop music. Like the one that continues to come up is like, uh, like a couple of the musicians, Lewis Cole is one of them. He just actually released an album today, which is pretty good. Um, and uh, Mono Neon, who is like a bass player, he's his Instagram account is he does that thing. He didn't invent this thing, but he does it prolifically where you take a viral video and then he like no, like notates out the intonation yeah, yeah, of the speaking yeah. on bass. Yeah. Like over. Yeah. It. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, he's he was the bass player for Prince, you know, in oh, the wow. days. And he's in the Ghost Note band, which is like got a couple of the snarky puppy percussionists in it amongst a bunch of other great funk musicians and so him and then like uh i don't know if you're familiar with jd and domi beck who are like Mm -hmm. um i don't remember what domi's full name is i'm pretty sure she's from france she's like they're like in there i mean until this they're they just did their first album but they were in their teens until now and they're Mm -hmm. very technically sharp but they're also um they have that like informal sort of self-awareness that come i feel like comes from Mm -hmm. the modern like age of like sort of social media yeah but they take yeah. they they don't take themselves very seriously, but they can really really play. Yeah, and yep. they're backed yep. by these all these like pop soul R and B like hip hop musicians like Anderson Pac and Thundercat and stuff, and they're like on their label and collaborating with all these rappers who are like net names, you know? <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's changed the way people consume media and music, and the way people network around music and media. It's really remarkable. Pretty interesting. All right, I'll I'll link that. Um, Consider those all my album picks of the week, but, mo- but mostly Oscar <laughs> Peterson. <laughs> um, any any apps you use lately that are noteworthy? Oh, I mean, I use a lot of a lot of things. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of stuff for my beginners. I've been um, 
right now I'm building them a website where I'm linking to apps, you know, things like the bandmate tuner and, and stuff. So I'm building a website. And so I'm using some of those tools. Um, you know, my kids are always, like I said, the bandmate tuner, I use tonal energy, like you, you mentioned earlier, but as far as like specific new apps, uh, for music, no, not really for music. Um, Oh, you know what I did? Because I told you my Adobe edition subscription ran out and I'm get a new one. I tried, um, this is a really interesting program for podcasters or newscasters is Hindenburg. Do you know this one? Hindenburg? How do you spell that? I like the, the, the blimp Hindenburg. Okay. H I N D E N. Yeah. Anyway, but it's, uh, it's meant for like long form media, like, like NPR stories kind of things. And it's very much like a storyboard. It's, it's an audio editor, but like I did a couple of podcast episodes because they had a free trial and maybe I just not skilled enough with it yet, but it's really powerful in that it, it really automates a lot of the things that are kind of onerous about more advanced software programs. Like when I do my podcast on audition, I've got to deal with the levels. I've got to deal with the, you know, the, the outputs so that everyone's equal. I got to do all the noise reduction, but this automates all of that, including like the levels. So it like automatically adjusts all the levels through the whole podcast so that everyone's voice is equal. So it's got a couple of really cool automation features. And, uh, so I was using the light version. That was pretty cool. I got to say that that was a good program, but I don't, I think I'm going to go back to audition cause I have someone going to buy it for me, but you know, that cool. is the gold standard. So that, but Hindenburg uh, light, if, if I wasn't using audition, I think I might give that a, a more long-term shot. I think it's like 99 bucks for uh, the light version. Okay. I'll, I've never heard of it and it's new. It definitely new is a segment on this mm-hmm. part of the show. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. It's just, you know, for the podcast people out there, it looked, it was cool. I won't even go music. I'll just say since we talked about Reddit at length, but I will recommend that if somebody is interested in, because people associate the the social media platforms, like what the app and the service are often like sort of bundled in people's minds. Like Facebook for, and then the reason for this is that Facebook famously is like there's only one Facebook. It's the blue app on your phone, and you mm-hmm. you use it to you have the app which is what gives you access to the whole entire experience of Facebook. I mean, there's obviously the website, but for a lot of these services, they actually like provide technologies for third party people to make their own apps. So like I use Mm -hmm. Tweetbot instead of Twitter, which I guess that could easily be my app pick of the week. I I certainly love it. Mm -hmm. Um, But what I use for Reddit is called Apollo. Oh, cool. Yeah, the free, the iPhone version, this will actually make you really love Reddit more, I think, because they have a, the free version is fairly generous in features. Okay. And I think I paid the guy. It's like one person who makes the app. It is sincerely one of the, like, if you're an iOS nerd, such as myself, and you, like, it, you care if people, developers, like, make their apps feel like they belong. Like, it really feels like if Apple designed Reddit, like, it feels as close to what that would be. And he, yeah, it just to- totally um, makes the experience of using Reddit a complete delight. The Reddit, the Reddit mobile app is actually, like, also trash. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, you know, I'm going to tell you, I use Tweetbot too. Isn't it a terrific app? Similarly has that design aspect to it, which makes me enjoy using it. Yeah, yeah. And the design, especially for a Twitter app, I've used a bunch of them. Man, the interface is everything because Twitter is very much interface based. That's the whole, that scrolling news thing. And I love the way Tweetbot lets you filter out your list so easily. That's great. It's terrific. really good. It's really good. Yeah. So good. I love it. I pay them whatever the six bucks a year or something. <laughs> yeah. I think I paid the, I think Apollo, I paid like, I think you can like tip. There's a tip jar. There's probably some features uh-huh. I'm getting that maybe are premium, but uh, I, you know, I think I threw him a couple bucks at one point. I mean, it's just, it's just so good. Changes the, uh, so if someone's like, if you're, if you've ever tried Reddit and you're like, well, the app is really bad, just to go download the free Apollo app. Well, I'm going to download it now. I've just always used the web interface. On my oh, phone. okay. Oh, I think you're going to really like it. Yeah. Well, you just heard the ding. So. Okay. The ding. Cool. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. My, I told you my daughter's doing travel softball. I've discovered the joys of ga- the game changer app for sports teams. I don't know if you know this, but like they have parents who like literally do play by play on the app during the game. So you can like see who's on base, what the count is, what balls and strikes. It's like, whoa, <laughs> it's really cool. It just goes to show you, like, in any domain, there's apps that just we don't even really know about because we're not involved in that. Or, you know, until she started this league, I would have never known about this. It reminds me of, like, when we were, you know, when we were, like, new parents, there was so many baby apps that I... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And most of them were terrible. There's a few really good ones. Um, yeah. 
I don't think I have any. Maybe there are some new parents listening. I gotta find it. I'll have to link it. There's a, there's a really good one because we were using one for like tracking all sorts yeah. of like baby data, and there's like a really really good one that I, it's called Mango Baby. We have all these great ideas about what we're going to do for our babies. But the reality is, is there a lot of work and it's really hard to do these things and live life and raise a baby. Yeah. You know, so, all right. Well, there's one more thing. I sometimes ask a tech, okay. a tech tip. Do you have any okay. like small, even the smallest thing that makes your computing life or your professional life easier? Let me think about that for a moment. I'll do mine. It's a keyboard shortcut. I can always, if I ever don't have one, I always just think of a cool keyboard shortcut. Um, so some, if you use the Mac, and this is do- doable on Windows too, um, it's just a different key command. So many know like the Alt tab or the command on the Mac command tab to like switch quickly between your different running applications. Mm-hmm. Well, if you have lots of Windows in a specific application open, you do command tilde, which is the little squiggly thing to the left of the one character. Uh-huh. And that's like a real quick way to like s- kind of swap between the open windows. And they oh, gave I didn't know that. Do you remember in the early Macs, there used to be a way to close all your windows, all the apps at once? Um, I don't think there's a way to do that anymore. I Well, there's like, what I do is this, there's a trackpad gesture to show the desktop. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Put them all. Close them all that way. But there was like an early Mac, so you could like literally click a command. It would close every app on the Mac. Like quit it entirely or just minimize? Yeah, quit, quit everything out. Quit everything out. But that's back when you had to log off all the time. You know, it was a different era of computing. Yeah. You know what I really miss from the early Mac days is the card stack that they had. That was such a great program. Oh. They completely got rid of that. Are you talking about HyperCard? Yeah, HyperCard. Yeah. That was an amazing program. Amazing yeah, there's, program. There's some developers who I follow who have been like trying to basically just slowly build back all of the features mm-hmm. that into the modern OS. Man. Yeah. So, you know, you know, I was thinking about tech tips and, you know, I don't think I have enough to offer in like just sort of basic tech, but I am a composer and I use Finale all the time. And so I'm going to, you know, give a shout out to a couple of plugins in Finale that make my life super easy as a composer. And the one is given is provided with Finale. It's called TG tools and it's in the plugins window. It comes prepackaged and there's an align move dynamics, a plugin that will automatically move all your dynamics to an average distance or the nearest element or the farthest element. It makes lining up dynamics and hairpins and all that stuff so easy to do. And the other one is a plugin set called JW plugins. I think you have to pay for it, but it's got some amazing things, including like, you know, starting a new part. Like if you want to start a new part within the middle, like a movement, or if you want to, um, you know, uh, get all your tremolos done correctly because Finale's terrible with tremolos. Just, just these plugins, but the Align Move Dynamics is by far my use, most used plugin. Anyway, okay. very cool. No, there are people. Just a composer that. tip. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, no, someone's going to be like, "That's great," or I already know that. <laughs> yeah, I love that. It's so interesting. Yeah. Um, do you listen to the Scoring Notes show at all? No, no. It's all about music notation software. Yeah, that's a good one. I'd like to listen to that one because, you know, I've, I've often thought about, you know, Finale has limitations and I know people love Sibelius, people love Dorico, but man, I started on Finale in 1993. I had like version 2.75 or something and, um, you know, I've been using it for, I don't know how many years it is. We're almost on 30 years now. Yeah. And so the learning curve, I mean, I know this program that's inside now. I, there's really nothing I can't do on Finale. And I just don't want to, it's that sunk cost fallacy, but I, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to change. It's, I mean, yeah, I mean like a lot of finale criticism is, is rightly deserved and it has not aged well, but like you're, you're, you're not the only one who feels that way about it. Like uh, who is, so one of the, I've thought of scoring notes because Darcy James argue, is that, is that how you pronounce him? Do you know his music at all? No, no. Oh my gosh. You've got to check out. uh, He's got a new thing coming out that was just, they just recorded. He's got a handful of albums. Um, but I would recommend my, just me personally would recommend that you do a search for Brooklyn Babylon. Okay. Which is, okay. um, he's, he's a jazz composer. He does these, uh, I don't know how to describe them. These like really like grand scale, like, um, large, like big band works, like album, like big band works that are in multiple different movements and have all sorts of themes and sort of interwoven throughout them. Some of them have multimedia, live performances with like live video that are paired with the performances. And, uh, it's, Mm -hmm. it's, he's one of the most really original musicians who's, who I've heard in the past decade. 
And uh, he was on the show talking about some of his, because he does a lot of music preparation and uh, he was just talking about his finale workflows. And he's like, yeah, you just, you, you know, there's when you, when you age, it's like, cause I'm always trying to be, I'm always a little reckless with my tech. I'm always trying the new thing, but the more experienced I get, the more I'm like, okay, it's just the wisdom is in knowing like, when does, do you not change the work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. And finale has a lot of problems. I mean, th- the fact that it doesn't have any sort of DAW feature where you can easily move sections of music around because the code is so fixed on notation. I mean, I feel like that's something that could really change the game for the program. You know, so you could move things around easy because, you know, as a composer, you often write something and then it ends up somewhere different in a piece. So then you're cutting and pasting and hoping you're not, you know, overwriting something you wanted. You know, it's so it's like a dance, right? There should be easier ways to do it where you can, like, designate sections. Anyway, that's my finale developer. Totally. Please. I don't want to be that guy, but Dorico, it does exactly the thing you're describing. I, I know it does. I know. I know. I know. It's also got a built a <laughs> piano roll that you can look at simultaneously as staff notation, which is kind of cool. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop. I wanted to try Dorico, but again, it's that sunk cost thing. I just, I know I grew up with finale. I mean, I went from professional composer directly to finale, the professional composer. Now that was some software right there. What about uh, li- what's lily pad? Oh, lily pad is like, really? That's like latex, right? Yep. Where you, you're, you're text editing, text centering all of it, and then it just sets it based on the... I can't imagine. I mean, I can't yeah. imagine because I, I do some of my productivity work in a text editor that... Yeah. You know, you know where that Lily, that, where that's used a lot is like among theorists who are setting like excerpts and very specific because you, you have fine granular control over like, like Shankarian analysis stuff, mm-hmm. you know, where you can do more and it's a, it's a, you know, it's just a little excerpt. It's not a whole score, but I couldn't do a whole score in that. That would drive me crazy. I'm sure there are people who do, but yes, I know there's, but it's not even, I mean, finale is difficult enough, but at least I have the music in front of me. <laughs> sure. You know, how do I do it without notes on the page that, you know, I, I'm a, a musician. I read the music. So I guess, you know, typesetters. Yeah, I, I, I understand it only from the perspective of someone who, so like my current note taking app of choice is, uh, I'm using, prof- uh, I'm sorry, what do we call it? Uh, personal knowledge management apps these days. This is my like next frontier. And I actually built a really, um, I don't think at like 11, 15 PM my time, I can like really adequately explain this. It was actually the first thing I did this morning was I walked into my, student learning objective meeting with my principal. And he was like, what are you like? What is your objective this year? Do you have a, is that a thing for you? Uh, like an annual? Yeah, but it's, it's much less formal. It's, I think it's more important for the classroom teachers, but you know, the 51 year old band director walks in. It's like, what's your goals for the fourth graders? Yeah. I don't know to get to a spring concert. Uh (laughs) You know, they give, I guess I get a long leash, but I think if I were, a younger teacher or at a more strict place, I would have to be a little bit more formal. I do have to submit a year plan, you know, a year yeah. at a glance. Yeah, plan. yeah. Yeah. So this is, so. this is, it's like an objective. So like I, I determine like what it is, but like for me, so we've, we've, uh, as our music team has been, I can give you the t- really top level and then I'll delete it. Cause I've talked about it a million times on this show, but like basically the top level of it is that we have created a skill based music mastery curriculum for all of our instrumental mm-hmm. students. That's and cool. well, yeah. And what we've done is we've, uh, the other band director and I have like collaborated on the sequence of songs and some of it's pulled from the method books they buy, but other things are like things we've composed or like exercises we've written. And the whole thing is organized into pa- almost like digital packets of five songs each. And every song has a five point rubric. And oh, cool. the idea is that they perform a packet of five songs for us until they've received 21 out of 25 possible points on that packet. And then they advance to the next one. Mm-hmm. there's sort of a gamified aspect to it. We give them a colorful ribbon at the end of it. They're color coded. You get a yellow ribbon when you finish one through five and you put it on your instrument case. And uh, what's cool is it's like, like a playing the, you know, Mario, you can kind of like, you have to get a certain number of stars to advance to the next world. But if you ever get stuck, you can go back and get all the stars you didn't earn in this earlier oh, and kind yeah, of beef yeah, up yeah, your yeah. star points. That's cool. So it's kind of neat. It's got, we have a digital, I don't, you know, it's like sticker charts are very much, a thing that some people still use. We have a whole digital, it's like a digital sticker chart where it's a leaderboard that was oh, that's cool. for them to the web. They can see, go see, go to clarinets and see like, you know, so you can that's imagine awesome. 
that this is all, and we've added this year um, a qualitative aspect for every kid has a secret URL link where we write them feedback on their performances. So on this date, nice. you played this song, got these point one two four, and none of it goes into the grade book except for the growth. So no one, like if you get one out of five points on song one, you did not just fail an assignment. You repeatedly come back every week and play these. And you're, we're looking for like an improvement. So that's my SLO is that uh, my co- beginning year concert band sixth graders will sh- ha- end the year with a certain number of points more than what they started with. Oh, cool. That's really cool. I, I would love to have something like that. I just, I don't even know where to start. Because we used to use a relational database application to track the student performance records of when they uh-huh. were for us. And the thing, the thing is, is like, you know, we were actually like our orchestra teacher developed it and it was a lot of work um, on him and it was hard to maintain it. And there was this aspect of like putting the data in the, particularly like the feedback in front of the students. It was just wasn't very transparent, which really fell apart during COVID because now we're not even in person to deliver verbally the feedback in addition to there's no way for them to read it after the fact. So sure. So we're using person, this personal knowledge management software, because a lot of it, you can create these almost like these, um, what you feel like you're interacting with, like a text note, like just a, a bunch of notes, like a note taking application. But what actually is published to the web is more like a wiki. So like all the things. Uh, talk to each other. So like when the kid re- goes to their note and they see on this date, you played this song and got these points. The song is a clickable thing that takes them to that part of the wiki straight into uh, the so like all right. these levels of like taking steps uh, again, demystifying the subject by removing any possible even if it's like down to the, we're removing like a couple of extra clicks and taps for you to find the thing we want you to practice. Mm-hmm. And then I made a pl- custom play along track for every song. So they've got a justly in tune tuning drone from tonal energy and then a metronome that plays for each of these songs. All the sheet music excerpts are embedded in the notes and published to the web for them. Wow. wow. And it, Oh, and it's right because they were both on board. The other band director and I, we, this follows them all three years. So like you start seventh grade with the stars, we call them stars, not points that you ended the sixth grade with. Right. And our administrators eat this up because like it's great. Lots of authentic, quick feedback, but then also like there's numbers. (laughs) And And what, what app website do you use to do this with? So the spreadsheet leaderboard thing where we track the numerical data is just a numbers spreadsheet, like Apple's, you know, uh-huh, and, sure. and those those have they have that Google Docs thing now where you can like access a, an iWork app from the web or a collaborate. Oh, okay. on one. So the both of us, the band directors and I collaborate into the same numbers document with our whole band program, and then the kids can see. They have like a secret link to basically see the leaderboard, which shows them like how many stars they have, how many stars they've earned on each song. Um, I see. And then the aspect of it that is like written feedback for them like their individual note and then all of the song pages and then there's sort of like a network of song pages per instrument so there's like a flute page that just says like well, song one song two song two you know all of them mm-hmm. um that is created in an application called craft which is a free actually a free there's a very generous free tier i think they limit you on how much data you can put into it not features so you can try the whole thing for free this kind of software is blowing up it's like i did a whole episode called second brain for the music educator with um dr cory meals um, mm-hmm. he's, uh, we just like went to town on this stuff like craft and the other, another popular one I use is called obsidian and they're like, you know, they're built around this idea of like sort of just wrangling lots of different disparate little bits of knowledge and then creating contextual links from one oh, that's to cool. the other and craft strength. One of its many strengths is that it, it's really easy to publish a thing. So you can take a little wiki that you've made of a bunch of interconnected notes and just click a button to get a URL that you can share with someone else. And then there it effectively is making a web, a little mini website. Oh, that's cool. Is this craft.do? That's the one. Yeah. And they now have a web and a windows app too. So like it's getting easier to collaborate with other people because they're not just on Apple stuff anymore. Oh, that's cool. Wow, I want to check this out now. I want to listen to that episode. He like really brought it. He actually had done a session at TMEA the last year on cool. The the guy uh, Tiago Tiago Forte is the guy who is like who is like making his brand the second brain thing. And yeah. um, so that was kind of the angle he was coming at, and he was like giving like really practical apps 
for music teachers. So craft obsidian, um, there's actually a podcast app called air where you can like capture book, basically bookmark things you think are good and it'll like save the, uh, the text into okay. a note taking app. So that's really cool. That's really cool. Cause I'm always looking for ways. Like I said, I have this website I'm building for my kids, but it's just, you know, so onerous to kind of do it the old fashioned way, you know? Anything that can pull knowledge together is right. So, like, we have a Squarespace site because we do believe we should have something available to a like if a parent doesn't have not yeah. doesn't have a Canvas account, like they should be able to see something some things about us. So we have yeah. a Squarespace website, which is I think one of the easier what you see is what you get kind of website builders. Yeah, but we're putting so much information on it that's just text and images, and we're like, why are we fussing around clicking around all these you know. And then this like thing that needs to be internet connected when we can just like, for example, our handbook this year, we put it in craft and mm -hmm. the link to the craft page is just, you know, linked out in our canvas and it didn't need to be on our website because all it is, is it doesn't need to be like fancy. It just needs to be links and images of what the method books look like they get. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm going to look at this pretty, pretty deeply tomorrow. You'll like it. It's, yeah. I mean, you can even use it as your note application. I use Ulysses as my writing tool. I love that application. So good. It's yeah. that's I would call that I'm making um I'm working on a long form blog post about this. It's like there's there's apps that are like simple and opinionated that like make lots of design choices for how they work, but then they really just work. <laughs> and that's yeah, yeah. That's that's that what I think of with that app is like it's mm -hmm. like it's like this is how it works. Because the the one thing that made um the reason Lily Pond made me think of um this is because the the more advanced version of Craft because Craft is very much like we have it's opinionated design we've just decided how this app works but it works it's very reliable mm -hmm. and friendly yeah. um the alternative is obsidian which is functions in some respects very similar like text documents with backlinks you know linking one note to the other um but but the thing is that under the hood every note is actually just a plain text file mm -hmm. and you what you see is you can do like links and images and other things. But what's actually happening under the hood is if you like, say you drag an image into a note, Obsidian is putting that image as a file in a folder somewhere and then creating a markdown link <laughs> to it, mm -hmm. but then parsing the markdown and the HTML inside of your notes so that they, it looks, you know, multimedia, but actually if you go to the file, um, it's just, a t it's just all like a string of text, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. makes it more of a power tool. But mm -hmm. then, yeah. then you can do cool stuff. Like you can, um, yeah. there's you can a, plugin, it. right. There's a plugin like, like finale, there's a plugin architecture. So people can add features to the app that are free. The whole app is free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, so like someone was uh, in one of my discords and they're like, Hey, I made an app like, cause you have to do, do a markdown link to get, um, a YouTube embed to actually show the thumbnail, like to show the YouTube little square inside, inside of the note. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Hey, I'm like, I made this plugin where you don't have to do any syntax. You just, if you just like paste a URL link into your note, then it'll show up as the video embedded right inside of your note. And I'm like, well, that's cool. Cause most note taking apps can't do web content in them. It's like mm -hmm. you drag something in and it's just, that's what it is for, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's like, are there any other websites that have content that you think would be cool for me to embed? And I was like, well, Hey, I use flat IO and note flight. Can you, and this is not a musician. And I'm like, can you check those websites out? And he's like, sure. And a day later, the guy was like, all right, I got it working. Go into this. <laughs> so I go into the settings of the simple yeah. embeds plugin and I check on, he has added note flight and flat and I check them on. I take a note flight link URL, put it in a note. And sure enough, the whole note flight little player shows up. That's cool. Side of the note. So we were going to build our whole database in obsidian for this reason and have um, playable note flight links, but it's so um, it's not, it just doesn't have the same friendliness as craft. So like the other band director at my school saw obsidian. She was like, no, thank you. And then I showed her craft and yeah. she was like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Yes, please. Let's uh -huh. let's go. Yeah. I mean, that's always the, the case, right? Is like, you know, you have to ju choose between simplicity and, and power in some ways it, it goes all the way back to the, the Mac versus PC debate back in the mm -hmm. day. You know, right. now there's so much, there's so more, there's less of that. There's less of a difference. But yeah, I mean, there's always that trade off. All right, Robbie, my last music technology question for you is why is there no app on the iPhone to teach kids note names with flashcards by instrument? 
Like you can say, I'm a beginning trumpet player. I've got, I need to learn the first six notes. Here are the flashcards. This is like such an easy thing to put together and no one has one. I feel Am like I missing it, something. I, I don't know of one off the top of my head. I've I, searched and searched and really, searched. It's got to exist or, and so, or someone could build it very easily. It's just, just that what you're describing is like an easy thing to build, but it's also kind of a specific thing to build. Yeah, there's no money in it, of course, right? Exactly that, right? So, some per, it would have to be a passion project. All right, well, I'll, I'll just, let you sleep. <laughs> yeah, it's time. Uh, all right, great. Well, I hope to do this again sometime. This was awesome, and uh, sure, sure, it was a good conversation. I enjoyed it. Cool. And then, uh, thanks so much for doing it. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. All Take right, it easy. enjoy. Take it easy. Bye. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for the episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in the podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review this show in the podcast app. It absolutely helps. It'll take a second and just a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about it. Learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. Please consider supporting me on Patreon at Patreon.com slash Music Ed Tech Talk. All support tiers get perks, but even the base tier gets you access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord community, where you can chat with other supporters and guests of the show about music, apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be, and I hope to connect with you soon. Thanks to this week's sponsor, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. Be sure to check it out, and see you next time.